presiding. Okay, please be seated, everyone. This is case number 2018 CA5321 John, uh, sorry, uh, Kowalski versus Johns Hopkins Ball Children's Hospital. Let's go ahead and take appearances starting with the plaintiffs, please. Greg Anderson and eventually Nick Rivian on behalf of the plaintiffs. Ethan Shapiro, Howard Hunter, Pat Krolls, David Hughes, our corporate representatives, Dr. Michelle Smith on behalf of Ball Children's Hospital. Thank you very much. I have been handed another exhibit list. Is it okay to admit those that have the yes by them? I would like that very much, Judge. And I will go through that. Any objection uh, from the defense? Uh, no, Your Honor. Okay. Madam Clerk, the court will receive without objection Exhibit 2123, page 10 only. Uh, exhibit 2123, pages 833 through 837, inclusive. Uh, the entirety of Exhibit 2512. And I think that are all of the stipulated agreements on these four pages. What's next? All right, Judge. Um, <clears throat> we have for the first witness under 2149, it's on the first page, about five down, Johns Hopkins organizational chart be used with uh, one of our witnesses, Joe Corcoran, our management expert. Okay, this is the 2012 on. version? Uh, yes, uh, and this is the last one that they gave us as available. So we have asked in deposition if there are any more after this. 2012 or 2021? Because this says 2012. 2012. Judge, I'm this, sorry, I missed Was this <laughs> back when it was All Children's, or is it now Johns Hopkins All Children's? It's now Johns Hopkins All Children's, and it still reflects, I believe, the same organization now. Why do we need 2012? Why don't we just start with 2015? I would like that. Uh, I think that would be better. Thank you for pointing that out. It was I understood that there's a organization. There's a committee well, roster. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. That, those look like committee rosters. I'm. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at it. So 2012. That's the most recent. Is that? What that was have? what was represented in deposition by multiple. Uh, John Hopkins, people. I'm sorry, what was the date on that? 2012. It's the organizational no, chart. The organizational chart has been updated since then, and the committee rosters we provided, I believe, were 2016, 17, 18, and 19, but, Judge, I, I failed to see the relevance of any of those. I, I have no problem with the committee roster, so... Court will receive 2142, 21, sorry, 2141, 2142, 2143, 2144. Now, is there a com organizational chart that is um, closer to 2015 than the 2012? I would love to see one from the defense. It was a point of contention through the depositions of the higher ups in the company, uh, Perno, Napolitano. Uh, Crane and uh, there's one other. Um, Judge, I believe there is. We just got this at midnight last night, so I, 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 I have to say I've not had a chance to look for it, but I, I do believe there is a more recent organizational chart. That's the 2012. Is there any problem though with the 2012? Only to the extent, Judge, that I don't believe it's been authenticated as being the one that was in effect at the time. Of course, on the other hand, I don't believe that the, the, the witness was provided this organizational chart as part of his we're, we're, repertoire. What, five, six years into this litigation and we don't have the organizational chart from 2015? I mean, I don't see how that's a state secret by any imagine. 
No one's taking that position, Jerry. Yeah. I, if 2012 is the most recent one that we have, then that's the one we're going to go with. Is if someone can tell me if there's a near to 2015, let's go with that one. And I'm not opposed, for the record, to substituting out if we do go or admitting it uh, again. The uh, 2015. If if council will produce it, like I said, it's been part of Duca's Tecum request for a long, long time. I, so. Judge, I've, there have been something like 50,000 pages of, of documents exchanged in this case. I do not have them committed to memory. Right. And, and that's but, fine. But I, I do not believe this is the most recent that was produced. I know that there was a series of them produced at some point, and I can't tell Your Honor exactly when that was. I can tell you that there were others produced, and I, and I just don't... I don't see you any harm in admitting 2012, and if we find a more recent one, that's fine. I, I just don't see how that harms anything. Very well, Your Honor. If, if I could, we understood that Dr. Hanna was going to be the first witness this morning. Am I now hearing that Dr. Corcoran is? No, we're not. No, we're not putting on Dr. Corcoran first. We got. Uh, uh, and I, I should have emailed you, but the decision wasn't made till eleven thirty last night. We're not going to call Dr. Hanna. You don't have to worry about that. But it's not going to change things because we're still calling Dr. Corcoran, but we're not calling him until the remainder of the people that we talked about are um, are taken care so, of. So, so after they spent later. all evening preparing for a live witness, that you told them that was going to be first up. At 11.30, you make the decision, and then you don't even bother to tell them? Judge, I mean, how, how is that? Midnight, it would have been midnight by the time I told them. I did not believe it would be uh, Judge. any good. And Judge, they sent us other things at midnight. They sent us, frankly, this exhibit list at midnight. So, And, and we get up early and work in the morning for the day's preparation, so that excuse is unacceptable. The exhibit list was sent yesterday. It was... Down. Right, I know, agreed. I'm just saying we were working at midnight, okay. as were you. And, and we had prepared for him as well. But we made a decision based on speaking with Dr. Hanna and in preparation as part of trial tactics that we did. We think that the jury has heard quite enough about ketamine and about CRPS and calling yet another doctor. At what time did you make the decision not to call him? 11.30, 10.30, 11.30, because we could not get in touch with him. I actually made the decision earlier, but I could not get in touch with him. And in fact, his office administrator was in touch with me, telling me that um, he was set to go, and I was like, sure. And we committed it and decided that we don't have the time to put on another two-hour witness on ketamine and CRPS. And we're down to the nitty gritty here, Judge. We just have to make some tough decisions. And I'm sorry if counsel had prepped on it. They are getting paid to do this stuff. And I've got. That, 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 that has nothing to do with it. I'm it, just. It, the, the whole point of telling the, wit, or telling the other side at lunchtime who's going to be the next day is so they can prepare. Do, do you know how wrong that what you just said is? You said you'd, you'd even. Uh, determined it earlier, but hadn't talked to Hannah about it. You didn't even bother to tell them. What's wrong so with late, that? Judge. It was so late, it wouldn't have made any difference in our view. Why well, call okay. them? I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a break. I want the two of you to talk about what people are coming. There's got to be a different way of than deciding at 11.30 at night, 10.30 at night, 9.30 at night, not telling the other side. That is just wrong. Cannot happen again. I, I, I am so tired of how you're not telling the other side information. It's just wrong. We're going to take a break. All rise. Close your recess.
corporate bylaws under 2159. And what's the objection to the corporate bylaws? Relevance, Your Honor. Overruled. Court will receive 2159. If I can backstrike in, we did find the 2016. Uh, and what, what exhibit number is that? Which one is they using that? It's uh, JHACH 19,511. Is it a identified exhibit, trial exhibit number? I don't see one on this copy I've been handed, Your Honor. Okay, in my Zoom feed, I have a person I assume is a witness, Regina Schimmel. This is Beata's sister, Your Honor, first witness for us. Okay, Ms. Is she the one that needs an interpreter? Yes. yes, she is. Do I have the interpreter here? Yes, Your Honor. He's because uh, I, I need to tell the witness I'm going to put the witness into the waiting room. So can someone come down and tell this witness what I'm doing so the witness understands? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, can, can we go? Can you just translate this? Uh, Sure. Good morning, Ms. Schimmel. This is Judge Carroll. Dzień dobry, Pani Chmiel. Tu jest Sędzia Carroll. Dzień dobry. Witam wszystkich zgromadzonych. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Ma'am, I understand you're going to be a witness this morning. Rozumiem, że będzie Pani świadkiem dzisiaj rano. Tak, będę świadkiem. Yes, I will be a witness. And there's going to be some things I need to do outside of your presence, so I'm going to put you in the waiting room for a little bit, okay? Są rzeczy, procedury, które muszę wykonać poza Pani obecnością, więc umieszczę Panią w poczekalni elektronicznej, dopóki e, Pani nie przywołamy. Dobrze. Yes, I understand. Okay. Don't go anywhere. I'll call you back in a few minutes, but you're not going to be able to see what's going on. Proszę nigdzie nie odchodzić od miejsca, w którym Pani jest. E, za kilka minut e, sędzia Panią wezwie. Dobrze. Uh, yes. Okay, I've removed that witness and put that witness into the waiting room. Thank you, uh, Mr. Interpreter. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's, uh, so the 2016 bylaws, or sorry, 2006 org chart isn't identified as a trial exhibit? I know this is the only one we had. Uh, we can substitute. This was produced to plaintiffs 1223-20 and 428-01. Well, it's on our list, but it's not on this. No, I see it. We just want to make sure it has the same people. Well, the other organization chart doesn't have the people. It's just got the organization and titles. Just make sure it's the same. Yeah, we're, we're fine substituting this, Your Honor. Okay, well, why don't we just put it as the next number in the series to hand it to the to the clerk and I tell us what number in the series it is madam clerk it's 28 so the court receives 28 over 2 this one has a little bit of highlighting on it I don't think it matters does it matter to you that there's two things highlighted on there what's next uh, then we have the uh, Johns Hopkins medical record access log for uh, October 8th, 2016. This has to do with the Kathy Beatty and the access uh, to Maya's medical records without authorization from the parents. Is this only access to Maya Kowalski's file so I don't have to worry about any any other patient's HIPAA issues? Correct. The, the Okay, let's go ahead and put it up, please, so I can look at it. The access log in question, Judge, this has come up before, and we, we had a, the, the, the issue before was authentication and explanation. The purpose that I understand this is being offered for is to demonstrate that Sally Smith accessed the, uh, the, the medical record on or about October 8, 2016, to which we are prepared to stipulate. This, this thing, if, if you, as you'll see when it's up in front of you, has got nine or ten different columns with nine or ten different explanations. It's not susceptible of ready interpretation without someone who knows what it says. And so we object to their just putting it in 
without authentication or without explanation or context of what the various uh, columns and, and uh, information tranches mean. But once again, we're prepared to stipulate that Sally Smith did, in fact, pursuant to her, her uh, status as, as a staff physician and, and CPI investigator, access the chart. They don't need to put this in. That's, that's, that's agreed to. We would prefer to have the written document in evidence in case there is a dispute either on appeal or otherwise as to the scope of any stipulation and any issues that could come up during the defendant's case or rebuttal um, countering this. So with all due respect to counsel, we prefer to have this actually in and we do have the codes and they're not particularly difficult to ascertain and on behalf of Maya Kowalski, we waive any uh, confidentiality for the pur for these purposes. Well, there, there, there's no authentication issue. I mean, I think the parties have agreed that this is the access log. It is and the access log, Judge. The question would, is what it, what the various columns mean. And what I'm, what I'm concerned about is, is some element of surprise and, quote, interpretation of these things without context and without reality and challenging. You can call a witness to explain the meaning of this, but the reality is they are contending that Dr. Smith is the apparent agent of the hospital, and this directly um, is evidence of their contention, so, or potentially, okay. arguably. Well, you can make all faces you right, want, right, well, Mr. I, Hunter. I, I understand, Your Honor, but th but there's no authentication. Faces, okay? I'm sorry. Not today. There, there, there is no indication that there was any connection between her accessing this chart and her status as an apparent agent. We, uh, you we can argue that to the jury. Okay. jury. You don't, they don't have to take your stipulation. It, I mean, they don't have to take the stipulation. They didn't take it, so the court will receive uh, 2165A as an alpha dash 071, that page only. What's next? 2249. J hash policy, HIPAA policies for providers, authorizations. Um, it, uh, they had raised an objection. I will let them do it, but as relevant and material for the same reason as the uh, item before, the exhibit before, in order to interpret uh, 2165A 071, 2249 with the codes and the HIPAA policies would be, uh, would be necessary. Well, there is no cause of action for HIPAA violation in no. this complaint. I, I just... That was my concern, Judge. I'm not sure why they're putting not. in and why that's relevant to to their, to their the other. I mean, it's all about HIPAA. So... And, and Your Honor, to the extent there's going to be an argument that there was a HIPAA violation by accessing the chart on 10 16 we have a pending motion. I know about that. Plaintiffs never filed a supplemental yeah. brief to support yeah. requested. And I think we're at some point today before Dr. Corcoran prepared to argue how this is absolutely not a HIPAA violation under Florida statutes or the Code of Federal Regulations. And even if it was, there's a Florida statute that says we're not even supposed to be talking about that in the malpractice court. Well, again, there's no cause of action for a HIPAA violation, so. Mine's only for the codes, Judge. If we compare it down to just having the codes, I want to make sure. What do you mean by the codes? I'm looking at the policy. What are you talking about? Uh, it was my understanding that within this document, it set forth the rules and regulations and how to code it. But if it doesn't, then for now we can withdraw. We need to move on anyway, Judge. So we'll withdraw for now and, and then come back to it. What's the next one? 2056 is at the top of the list. I think that was skipped. Can you put that up for us? This reflects uh, one of Sally Smith's various roles in the hospital this time uh, as part of the residency program at Johns Hopkins. It goes to our parent agency discussion. Judge, no objection except for the highlighting. Well, okay. this is not our highlighting. This is how it was discovered. I said object. You said no objection. Okay, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Your Honor. Um, we do object to the relevance. 
and who, who's going to make it relevant. Is this a like a published list? And yes. Yeah, no. Okay. We're just going to overrule the relevance. I will okay. receive two zero five six. And, and you don't have a, a version that doesn't have the highlighting on it. No, yeah, that's how it was. We, I mean, we can try to remove it if it's necessary. Well, Judge, highlighting can be removed pretty easily on anymore on PDFs. Well, again, it's what the clerk has. The clerk probably has yeah. it highlighted. Substituted in, then perhaps. You tell me, everyone. Uh, we prefer not to do it. Well, we'll, we'll do what the court requires. Or if, if they require that highlight be removed, we'll, we'll work on that. That one, I mean, out of all the things to worry okay. about in this case, okay. I don't think I, this I is I appreciate one. that, Judge. All right. <clears throat> Your Honor. This uh, is the art of the possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. In the interest of time, we'd like to, and I think we're going to have a lunch discussion, we'd like to move down to the second to last page of the list, Exhibit 2277, which begins with the risk management file. And within that, I'd like to move, I guess I'm on the last page now. Page six two eight. Six two. Uh, sorry, what? Because right. this this list isn't in chronological order, so let me just find it. Well, it's so two two seven seven, and within two two seven seven, there are several hundred pages. So if you go to this, oh, I got the you. last entry six two eight six two nine, and this is an internal email at Johns Hopkins uh, regarding Maya's care and treatment. Judge, it's an internal email that recall, that call, refers to Attorney Hunter that talks about the dependency is, action. Is, is this the one that I already ruled on, or is this a different email? This is a different one. It's the same issue, Judge. Um, this is all talking about testimony at the dependency hearing. And then refers to in the second paragraph. Uh, stop, attorney, stop, stop, okay. Yeah. Refers in the second paragraph to Attorney Hunter. Okay. Well, let, let's go. In my mind, the first thing is. Can I see the, the two in the front again? Are any of these individuals? Jackie Cranes, is she the, uh, remind me, she's the nurse or she's the general counsel? General counsel. So the first issue is attorney client privilege, but then there was the issue of inadvertent disclosure. But was this? document included in the inadvertent disclosure no. that the, so okay so effectively we've got a waiver of attorney client privilege here at this point is that where i'm at there's not there's not an express attorney client communication here other than what i was allegedly advised of the the real objection here, Judge, is, is going to be with the, with the DCF matter, because this is replete with that entire matter. Yeah. So in my mind, I've moved on beyond attorney-client privilege. Now I'm going to go to the relevance. Can you um, make it the text larger, please? Mr. Reyes, thank you.
there's going to have to be a couple of redactions in this email. Understood. Um, but the balance of it is going to come in. The what, what date is this again? December 30th. And where were we on the dependency court orders with respect to visitation? The, I believe the most recent order before this email was a December 27th order. And well, there, there's a reference in here about exercising the right to supervise. Was that permitted under that? Under that order was the first time, uh, it's my recollection, that the hospital was granted express permission to supervise those calls. In the order, Judge, as opposed to DCF asking them to do it, but they are expressly allowed to supervise. I, have the I, I think the, the sentence that starts, Maya was not allowed to listen in, that sentence has to come out. All right. The following sentence, the judge didn't let Maya listen in, Yes. needs to come out. And, and is there any, is this sentence correct that mom's mother is allowed unsupervised FaceTime at 11 a.m. and 5 p.m.? Judge, I'd have to look at the order specifically. I, I, I think they it. mean Maya's mother. But. I have well, I, it's Beata. Yeah. And it's a paragraph two of the order. Mother shall have an ACH shall permit visit by any electronic device, i.e. iPhone, Skype, FaceTime, or similar method at approximately 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. daily. Such communication may be supervised by a guardian ad litem, the child's case manager, or any member of the hospital staff, but does not have to be. I can read the balance if the court wants. There's a few other points. Why don't we um, just redact where it says mom's mother through the balance of that paragraph. So the rest of that paragraph, Your Honor, comes out? Yes, and then the following paragraph, let's redact, but leave in, I did advise Dr. Majors to get pictures of the scratches. Okay. And... Um, sorry, Judge. The second Wait sentence. Second. The... the, the um, sentence, the third sentence of that paragraph where it says Howard also agreed, that sentence needs to come out. Understood. But the talking about getting pictures of the scratches and an inquiry to how Maya got them needs to stay in. Your Honor, in the paragraph above that begins, I just got off the phone with the case manager. The second sentence reads, everyone is over this case. Oh, can we keep that? Yeah, Judge, that's referring to the DCF case. I don't. It's referring to And it's out of perspective if the rest of it's removed. I, I agree. That, that sentence without the context of the sentence before or after could be um, misleading. Understood. So, okay, are we clear on what needs to be redacted? Uh, uh, yeah, we'll put it back to them. Okay, so we'll need to get to the clerk a printed copy of it. So ultimately, I will be admitting and we'll call it A on that one. I will also need the retest. So 628-629-A. Testimony of Dr. Majors. Okay. 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 I'm only looking at one page. Where's the second uh, page? The second page is uh, just a continuation. It's nothing more than, I think, a logo. Can we see the second page? Okay. Okay. No, we're, we're going to leave in the logo. So, yes, uh, ultimately it'll be received as 2277-628A and 629A. It'll be redacted.
case. Is there anything that we have to do before we bring in the jury? Uh, I think we can wait. Your Honor, I did, as a threshold matter for the witness that's coming, I did want to... Who's coming? Um, the, the next witness that's coming. Who, tell me who the next witness Regina, is. Regina. Oh, that's right. Regina, that's right. Okay. Yeah, Regina. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of hearsay. I anticipate being on my feet quite a bit. Almost everything that this witness knows during the hospitalization came through hearsay conversations from essentially Bayonne Kowalski. So I just, I don't know exactly what she's being proffered for, but her universe of knowledge in terms of personal non-hearsay interaction is essentially nil. I don't know where we're going with this. I'd just like some clarification from the opposing counsel. I don't, I don't think this is going to intrude on uh, what Beata told her about the hospitalization. I think that's the purpose of the testimony. The only thing I can think of is how did you learn about Beata's death, which is not exactly, it's just a name, date, and would be an exception to hearsay, I believe, under statements regarding uh, reputation, personal, family, statements regarding personal or family history. And I, birth, marriage, divorce, death, relationship. Sounds like they're not going to ask about statements she was making inside the hospital. So, well, like they told us what you know she's not being proffered for. I'd like to hear a little bit about of what she's being proffered for. And again, the admonition too is it's not just what happened in the hospitalization, but there's a lot of deposition testimony here about what Beata told the witness about what was going on. I, I, I don't want to go through her whole testimony outside the presence of the jury and then have to redo it again on okay. a witness that also is going to need the the, the services of. An interpreter. All right. So let's. Um, Madam Clerk is asking about 2159. 2159 is in evidence. And we got the 2016 org chart, which is 2802 in evidence. So we don't need 2149. Is that correct? I'm sorry. The, the clerk wanted to know about 2149, and my recollection is since we put in the 2016 org chart at 28049. You're welcome, Madam Clerk. Okay, let's do this. Let me uh, have the clerk swear the interpreter in. I will then swear the witness in outside the presence of the jury, and then I will tell the jury, like I've done with the other witnesses, that I swore the witness outside the presence. Come on down, Mr. Interpreter. Debbie Cole. Oh, I. We, we don't need a chair. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will make a true interpretation of the questions asked and the answers given, and that you will make a true translation of any writing which you are required by your duties to decipher the translator? I do. Okay, I'm going to bring in uh, the witness. And are you fine standing there? Or do you yes, I'm fine. Sit mm -hmm. down. If, if you get tired and need to sit down, let us know. We'll Thank you. Make that work for you. I, I guess I'll stand over here. Hmm. Stand next to him. Uh, why don't you go to that lectern and then Mr. Anderson can go to this lectern. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, I'm just have a better view of the monitor here. Does that matter or not for the. Well, I. I tell you what, why don't you come sit on the witness stand? Okay. There's a monitor there. Okay. Sure. And I will. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning again, Miss. Is it Chimmel? Dzień dobry, Pani Chmiel. Dzień dobry, Did I say that properly? In, in Polish, it's pronounced Chmiel. Chmiel? Close enough. Well, I'm sorry. I try to get everyone's name right. Chmiel. Chmiel. Chmiel? Yeah. That's perfect. Chmiel? Um, my understanding is you currently are in the Chicago area. Is that correct? I understand that you are in this moment in the area of Chicago. Is that correct? Yes, I am in the Chicago area. Under our rules, since I am a judge in the state of Florida, ponieważ ja jestem sędzią w stanie Florida, 
I need your permission to administer uh, the oath before you testify. Potrzebuję, żeby pani się zgodziła na dokonanie przysięgi, zanim pani będzie zeznawać. What that means for you is if there was ever an enforcement action or a perjury action. Dla pani to znaczy to, że jeżeli kiedykolwiek ktoś niósłby jakąś akcję o krzywo przysięstwo against you based on your testimony here today, przeciwko pani na podstawie tego, co pani dzisiaj zeznaje, you are agreeing to personal jurisdiction in Sarasota County, Florida. Zgadza się pani na to, żeby taka akcja sądowa, jeżeli by była taka, miała miejsce w Sarasocie, w Florydzie. Because even though you are sitting in Chicago, you were actually testifying in Sarasota County, Florida. Dlatego, że mimo to, że pani w tej chwili siedzi w Chicago, to zeznaje pani e, w Sarasocie na Florydzie. Okay. I understand. With that understanding, uh, do you agree I can administer the oath to you? Rozumiejąc to, co powiedziałem, czy zgadza się pani na przysięgę? Tak. I do. Please raise your right hand. Proszę podnieść prawą rękę. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give is the truth? E, czy pani przysięga, że wszystko to, co pani powie w zeznaniach jest prawdą? Tak. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Dziękuję pani. Let's bring in the jury. Your Honor, I'm sorry. If, did I miss it? I don't remember you swearing in the interpreter. Uh, the clerk swore the oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Okay, let's bring in the jury. Mm. Okay, everyone, please be seated. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and you received no information. Is that correct? And have you been approached by anyone about this case since you were with us last? No. And have you re reviewed any media coverage of this case since we were last year? No. And you all doing okay this morning? I asked a different question. Are you all doing okay this morning? Trying to keep you on your toes. Okay. Uh, members of the jury, our next work witness uh, is testifying from the Chicago area. Uh, and needs the services of a Polish interpreter. Uh, outside of your presence, I have sworn in both the interpreter and the witness. Poza waszą obecnością przysięgi dokonał i tłumacz, i świadek. So the witness will be testifying under oath just like every other witness has. Świadek będzie zeznawał pod przysięgą, tak jak każdy inny świadek w sprawie. <coughs> Mr. Anderson, uh, you may inquire. Panie Anderson, może pan zadawać pytania? I hope you do not mind if I just call you Regina. I mam nadzieję, że nie będzie pani miała nic przeciwko temu, jeżeli będę się pani do pani zwracał jako Regina. Dobrze, miło mi. Uh, thank you, it's a pleasure. You're Beata Kowalski's sister. Czy pani jest siostrą Beaty Kowalski? Tak, jestem. Yes, I am. Where do you live? Gdzie pani mieszka? Mieszkam w Chicago. I live in Chicago. How long have you lived there? Jak długo pani tam mieszka? 21 lat. 21 years. And where did you live before that? Gdzie pani mieszka uprzednio? Mieszkałam w Polsce. I lived in Poland. And when you moved, was Poland still under communist rule? Kiedy or, pani... had it, or had it uh, been freed? Kiedy pani przeprowadziła się do Stanów Zjednoczonych, czy Polska jeszcze dalej była pod uh, władzą komunistyczną, czy już została wyzwolona? Już została wyzwolona. It had been freed. 
For how long? Jak, jak długo? Uh, mia, uh, miałam 28 lat, uh, jak uh, w Polsce został obalony komunizm. I was 28 years old when communism was toppled in Poland. And how old would Beata have been then? Ile lat miała wtedy Beata? Jak został obalony komunizm w Polsce, moja siostra miała 16 lat. When communism was toppled in Poland, my sister was 16 years old. So both you and your sister lived into your teens under communist rule? Więc zarówno pani, jak i pani siostra, będąc nastolatkami, żyły pod władzą komunistyczną. Tak. Yes. And <coughs> did that shape Beata's view of life from what you saw? Czy to przeżycie w jakiś sposób ukształtowało poglądy Beaty na życie z tego, co pani mogła zobaczyć? Tak. Yes. Uh... Nasi rodzice mówili nam, że trzeba walczyć o ważne sprawy. Nasz tata w czasie komunizmu należał do Związku Zawodowego Solidarność 1980. Our parents told us that we should fight for things that are important to us. Our father belonged to the Solidarity Union movement. Nasz tata był jednym z liderów tego ruchu, który walczył o prawa ludzi i walczył z komunizmem. Our father was one of the leaders of the movement that fought for human rights and fought against communist rule. Uh, Ma'am, are you reading off of something? This is Judge Carroll. Sędzia pyta, czy pani czyta z notatek. Mam notatki i, i patrzę, patrzę, żebym po prostu powiedziała dobrze. I Mogę made... korzystać z notatek moich? I made some notes. I just want to make sure that uh, that I'm saying what I'm saying correctly. Am I allowed to use these notes? Well, let's turn over your notes and not use them. If you need to use them, let us know <coughs> beforehand, okay? Sędzia prosi, że pani odrzuciła notatki do góry nogami. Nie używała ich. Jeżeli pani będzie je potrzebowała, proszę o tym powiadomić sędziego. Hmm. Yes, Your Honor. Not to get into too much of a history lesson, but was the solidarity, solidarity movement under Lech Walesa the beginning of the fall of communism in I Eastern Europe? Tutaj wchodzić w lekcję historii, ale chciałem pani zadać <coughs> pytanie, czy ruch Solidarności pod kierownictwem Walesy był jedną z przyczyn upadku komunizmu? Hold on a second. I'll only check the relevance of this last Sustained. Uh, so, tell, tell her not to answer that question. Ma pani nie odpowiadać, dlatego że y, adwokat y, strony Jugi wniósł sprzeciw, sędzia ten sprzeciw uwzględnił, że to nie jest istotne. From the way that you and your sister were raised, do you believe that there was an inherent distrust of government from being under communist rule? Uh, czy z tego... Tak jak państw, pani i pani siostra były wychowane przez rodziców, czy zgodziłaby się pani z tym, że był jakby zakodowany brak zaufania wobec instytucji rządowych? Nie wiem, na ile moja siostra pamiętała, ale myślę, że miało to duży wpływ na nią, ponieważ nasz tata został internowany i osądzony, i osądzony w więzieniu jako Uh, więzień polityczny i nie było go pół roku. Uh, I don't know exactly how much uh, of this affected my sister, but I assume I would think it ha had affected her, uh, had affected her because um, my father, our father, had been imprisoned by the government authorities for a period of uh, six months. Nasz, nasz, nasz tato został internowany w grudniu, 13 grudnia 1981 roku na oczach swoich małych dzieci. Our, our father was interned on December 13th, 1981. Uh, he was taken, he was arrested, taken in while his small children were watching this uh, happen. Tato został zabrany z domu 
i nie wiedzieliśmy gdzie on przebywa. Our father was taken from his house and we didn't know where he was being taken to. Did this? Go ahead. Chicken continue. To na pewno było wielkie przeżycie dla niej, dla ośmioletniego dziecka. Jeszcze do tego naszej mamy nie było, bo kilka miesięcy wcześniej pojechała do Stanów Zjednoczonych. It was a very it was a very impactful experience for an eight-year-old. My sister was eight years old. Hey, um, uh, addition, sorry. Finish out the additionally, so because our mother had not been at home, she was in the United States at the time. Okay, okay. ma'am, we need to wait for the next question before we uh, say anything else. Musimy czekać na następne pytanie, zanim, to znaczy pani musi czekać na następne pytanie, zanim pani będzie kontynuować od pytania do pytania. Adwokat chciał mieć sprzeciw, mówiąc, że na bazie istotności. Sędzia nie zaakceptował sprzeciwu, ale musi pani czekać na następne pytanie, a odpowiadać tylko na pytanie, które jest zadane. Were you and your sister taught to assert yourselves in order to get something done with a bureaucracy? Czy panią i panią, pani siostrę uczono tego, żeby być asertywnym, żeby być pewnym siebie w konfrontacji z biurokracją, żeby, żeby po prostu domagać się swego? Może pani odpowiedzieć? Myślę, że tak. Rodzice nam wpajali to zawsze, że trzeba walczyć o swoje i stawiali nasi rodzice na edukację nas. I, I believe so. Our parents always taught us to stick up for ourselves and to educate ourselves as best we could. So was the Roman Catholic religion important in your family? Czy wiara rzymskokatolicka religia była ważna w rodzinie pani? Tak, była bardzo ważna i jest. Yes, it was and still is very important. How often did you get to see your sister once she moved to the United States. Jak często widywała pani siostrę od czasu kiedy ona przeprowadziła się do Stanów Zjednoczonych? Kiedy kiedy ja przyjechałam ze swoją rodziną do Stanów Zjednoczonych, Beata wyszła za mąż i założyła swoją rodzinę. I spotykaliśmy się bardzo często. After I had moved to the United States, Beata had married, she had her own family, and we met very frequently. Is that how you pronounce Beata's name in Polish? Czy tak się wymawia imię Beaty po polsku? Beata, a w domu mówiliśmy na nią Benia. The Polish pronunciation is Beata. At home she was called Benia. Benia. So, uh, did you have the opportunity to observe Beata's interaction with her children, with Kyle and pani, Maya? Czy miała pani okazję obserwować interakcję między Beatą a jej dziećmi? Tak, be, tak. Beata, jak mieszkała na przedmieściach Chicago w Ermchus, tutaj urodziły się jej dzieci. Spotykałyśmy się bardzo często na urodzinach swoich dzieci, na świętach, pomagałyśmy sobie nawzajem. Była yes. bardzo dobrą uh, matką. Przepraszam. Uh, when she uh, was married and had children, we would meet very often. We would meet for family holidays and other, on other occasions. Uh, she was a very good mother. We met quite frequently. And when you spoke, did you speak Polish? Kiedy spotykałyście się, czy mówiłyście po polsku? Tak, mówiliśmy po polsku. Jej dzieci chodziły do polskiej szkoły raz w tygodniu, by uczyć, by uczyć się języka polskiego i Beatka mówiła zawsze do nich po polsku. Yes, we spoke Polish. The children went to Saturday school to learn Polish and Beata always spoke to them in Polish. Uh, at the time uh, Beata passed, how well were the children doing in communicating with the rest of the family in Polish? Wtedy, kiedy odeszła Beata, 
na, na ile z powodzeniem mogły się komunikować dzieci ze zresztą rodziny po polsku? Kiedy po tragicznej śmierci mojej siostry kontakt z jej dziećmi był bardzo znikomy. After the tragic death of my sister, the contact that we had with her children was very sporadic. Before that, were they coming along in the Polish language uh, so that you could communicate easily directly with them? Pytanie jest, czy przed śmiercią Beaty, jak na ile dobry był ich polski, czy mogła pani się z nimi swobodnie porozumiewać w języku polskim? Tak, mogłam się porozumiewać. Spotykałyśmy się, przytulaliśmy się nawzajem. Dzieci bardzo mnie lubiały, yes, naszą mamę, uh, babcie. Uh, I could freely communicate with them in, in Polish. Uh, we hugged, we had a very good time. They, they were very close to me and their grandmother. And when was the last time you spoke with either Kyle or Maya? Kiedy to było ostatnim razem, kiedy pani rozmawiała albo z Kyle, albo z Mają? Z, z Mają i z Kajem wysyłamy sobie tekst message, bo na, najlepiej nam się w ten sposób porozumiewać. Nie dzwonimy do siebie, tylko SMS-ujemy. Yes, sure. Is one of the two texts running this through the system? So the jury can see. Okay. Pytanie jest, czy jurorzy widzą okay. pani obraz. Oh. <laughs> Teraz się pani obraz pojawi. Oh, oh, zniknęłam. Sorry about that. Oh uh, <laughs> should I uh, interpret the question? Yeah. Um, I can't even remember the question. The question was whether um, uh, whether Ms. Camille had communicated, when was the last time she had communicated with the children? That was the question, please. Kiedy pani, jeszcze raz, jak pani odpowiedziała na to pytanie, kiedy pani ostatni raz miała kontakt z dziećmi? Uh, z, z dziećmi mojej siostry kontaktujemy się codziennie przez SMS-y. Nie dzwonimy do siebie, dlatego że one nie mówią już po polsku, a ja tylko troszkę mówię po angielsku. I, I, przepraszam, uh, I contact the children regularly, we communicate through text messages, we, we contact each other every day. Uh, text messages are a better mode of communication because the children uh, no longer speak English well and uh, I don't speak, uh, I'm sorry, no longer speak Polish well and I don't speak uh, English well enough to, to have a fluid conversation. So without Beata, has it become more difficult to, for the children to communicate with the, your side of the family? Czy bez Beaty jest w tej trudniej dzieciom komunikować się z pani stroną rodziny? Tak, teraz jest bardzo trudno, dlatego że Beata, moja siostra, była łącznikiem między nami. Ona musiała become... Uh, may I ask the witness just to you know, yes, <laughs> no more than two sentences? <laughs> proszę, proszę panią, nie więcej niż dwa zdania, tak jak się umawialiśmy, bo mnie potem jest trudno wszystko przetłumaczyć. Uh, yes, the exchange has become much more difficult right now because Beata was the intermediary who was bringing us together, so, so it is more difficult now. Did you have an opportunity to observe your sister's interaction with Maya and Kyle on those occasions you were together? Czy miała pani okazję obserwować Beatę w relacjach z jej dziećmi, z Kyle i z Maya w tych momentach, kiedy byłyście razem? Tak. Yes, I did. Describe for the jury, from your position as an aunt, uh, how Maya interacted with her children. What kind of mother was she? Jeżeli pani mogłaby opisać ze swojej pozycji jako ciocia, jak Beata, jaka była interakcja między Beatą i dziećmi, jakiego rodzaju była mamą? Uh, jak Kajo, drugie dziecko, Beata urodziła, jak pamiętam, pamiętam... Uh, zaraz... When Beata gave birth to the second child, Kaja, I remember... 
a jej dziecko miało problemy z krwią jako noworodek. Uh, the child had problems with uh, blood as a, as a toddler. I Kajo został zabrany do innego szpitala po porodzie. And Kajo was taken to another hospital after, immediately after birth. To ona wypisała się ze szpitala położniczego i pojechała za nim. Uh, Beata had signed herself out of the uh, OB uh, hospital she was with and she went to, with, the, with the child. Uh, Chory Majo miał, co pamiętam, osiem razy uh, przetaczaną krew od swojej mamy. Uh, there were, uh, when Kyle was ill, uh, he had eight blood transfusions, uh, transfusions that were the source of the blood was, was the mother's blood, and that saved his life. Z tego, co pamiętam, Beata, moja siostra, była bardzo dobrą matką. Pamiętam, jak założyła dla niego taką książeczkę, from what I remember, Bata was a was a very good mother. I remember where she um, instituted a, a booklet for him. Taki pamiętnik, jak była w ciąży, prowadziła pamiętnik dla małego Kaja. It was a diary that she had written uh, while she was pregnant uh, for her child to read in the future. I jak pewnego razu byłam u niej na wizycie i oglądałam tą książeczkę, jak ona dokładnie pisała, jak, co, co czuła, jak, do, jak donosiła pod swoim sercem. One of the I, times when I was there, I, I had a chance to look at the, at the, book, at the booklet and, and read it, and she was very precise in, in recounting how she felt when she carried him under her art, heart during her pregnancy. Pisała praktycznie każdego dnia w, tej, w tym pamiętniku do Kaja. Pisała, pisała go swoją ręką i swoim sercem. Uh, she wrote practically every day. She wrote with her heart and with her hand. Natomiast uh, Maja, jej córeczka, uh, bardzo, bardzo ją kochała. Uh, she Maja, loved her daughter Maja very, very much. Uh, Maja, gdy była tutaj zdrowa w Ermpus, uh, razem z rodzicami jeźd jeździła na łyżwach. Byliśmy na takim pokazie na tych łyżwach. When Maja was healthy, she would go with her parents to go ice skating. We went to see ice skating shows. Słuchaliśmy jej uh, nagrań, uh, ponieważ Maja pięknie grała na pianinie. And Maya uh, played the piano very, very well, wonderfully, so we would listen to recordings of her playing the piano. Kiedy uh, Maya z rodziną przeprowadziła się na Florydę do Venice. Oh, when Maya with her family had moved to Florida, to Venice. I wkrótce, myślę, że tak dwa lata. And uh, within, I think, was two years. Maja zachorowała. Maja became sick. I Beata informowała nas i opowiadała o wszystkim, o jej zmaganiach z tą chorobą. Beata informed us about all the details. She told us uh, about all of Maja's struggles uh, in, in fighting the, the ailment. Ma'am, you need to wait for the next question. Proszę poczekać na następne pytanie. From what you saw, understanding uh, uh, most parents hopefully have a strong parental instinct, did Beata have a particularly strong parental protective instinct towards her children because of what she'd been through? I'm going to check the foundation. going to overrule that. You can translate. Mogę przetłumaczyć, sędzia pozwolił. Pytanie było takie, że zakładając, że większość rodziców ma instynkt opiekuńczy wobec swoich dzieci, czy powiedziałaby Pani, że Beata miała wyjątkowo silny instynkt opiekuńczy wobec swoich dzieci? Beata była 
zwykłą mamą, tak jak wszystkie dobre mamy. Beata was a normal mother, just like any other good mother. I'm, I'm not sure uh, that the witness understood right. your question. Uh, can you translate the uh, uh, parental instinct to protect her children? And I'm uh, trying to ask, is was Beata's more than stop. normal? Just ask a normal question. And he'll translate. And I'll try it. I'll object to the extent this is calling for care for evidence. Uh, You'll need to translate our discussion. Just right. ask your next question. Right. Did Beata have a strong instinct to protect Kyle and Maya from what you saw? Uh, okay, I'm going to sustain the objection. Let's go to the next question. All right. W tej chwili podtrzymał obiekcję sędzia, więc przechodzimy do następnego pytania. So since Beata's death, how much less are you've testified you see them less? How much less are you able to see Kyle and Maya and and they you? Od czasu śmierci Beaty, na ile mniej jest pani w stanie widywać się? z dziećmi, na ile mniej one są w stanie widywać się z Panią. Po, po śmierci Beaty widziałam dzieci dwa razy. After Beata's tak, death, I had seen the children on two occasions. Razem z moją rodziną, z moją mamą, która je wychowywała. Mama mm. moja do tej pory bardzo rozpacza, że nie widzi swoich wnuków, którymi się opiekowała. When I had seen them, I was in the company of my mother, their grandmother, who, who raised them, to, uh, who also raised them, and she is uh, despondent about the fact that she can't see them more. Brings up a good point. Now, who is in the United States from your side of the family that the children would be able to interact with? Kto jest w tej chwili od pani strony rodziny w Stanach Zjednoczonych, e, tak żeby dzieci mogły mieć e, jakby interakcję, widzieć się z tymi osobami, które są w Stanach Zjednoczonych? My tu mieszkamy wszyscy. Jest moja druga siostra, Elżbieta, jest mój brat, Piotr. Mama. Momencik. We all live here. There is my sister Elżbieta, uh, my brother Piotr. Mm -hmm. Proszę. Jest uh, siostrzenica uh, Klaudia. There is my niece Klaudia. Uh, i, I moje dzieci, a mam ich pięcioro. Wszyscy and my children czek and I have five children. Wszyscy czek czekamy na wizyty uh, Mai i Kaja. We all eagerly await uh, Maya's and Kyle's visits. Any cousins around their age? Czy mają, czy mają, e, czy są kuzyni mniej więcej w ich wieku? Maja i, Maja i Kajla. Są, e, moje dzieci są, e, są dużo starsi. Mój syn jest ojcem chrzestnym e, Kaja. My children are, are quite a bit older. My son is Kyle's godfather. And so now has that contact with your side of the family been reduced now that it's been a few years since Maya's, excuse me, Beata's passing. Uh, pytanie jest, czy, czy od śmierci Beaty ten kontakt y, został zmniejszony? Bardzo został zmniejszony. It has been reduced to a great degree. Po śmierci Beaty Rodzina się rozsypała. Wszyscy po prostu nie mogą sobie z tym poradzić. After Beata's death, the family fell apart. We can't cope with the situation. Is there any doubt in your mind that Beata would give her life for her children? Czy ma pani jakiekolwiek wątpliwości, że Beata oddałaby swoje życie za dzieci? Objection, relevance, foundation. We establish the foundation. Both the care for evidence. Sustained. Nie mogę tego, znaczy sędzia nie pozwala na odpowiedzi na to pytanie. And do you hope for more communication with Maya and Kyle in the future? 
Tak Czy ja. ma pani nadzieję na to, że będzie pani miała więcej kontaktu z Kyle i z Mają w przyszłości? Mam nadzieję, że, że się będziemy spotykać. Może I'm, już, może I'm już hopeful wkrótce. that we will be able to meet. Proszę dalej. Może już wkrótce przyjadą do nas na wesele. May, hopefully, maybe they will come to visit us soon for the wedding. Your witness. Thank you, Regina. Um, Mr. Hughes, your turn. Teraz uh, będzie adwokat obrony zadawał pani pytanie. May it please the court. Good morning, ma'am. Thank you for coming in. I'm sorry for your loss. Dzień dobry pani. Dziękuję za to, że się pani pojawiła. Jest mi przykro z powodu straty, jaką pani doznała. Does uh, Mr. Kowalski, Jack Kowalski, make arrangements for you and the family here in Florida to get together? Czy um, pan Kowalski, Jack Kowalski, uh, aranżuje takie możliwości, żeby pani rodzina mogła się spotkać z dziećmi? Trudno mi powiedzieć, dlatego że to Beata była tym łącznikiem, jak żyła. It is difficult for me to say because Beata was the was the the instigator of of family gatherings. To jest my mieszkamy w Chicago, oni miesz, mieszkają w Venice. We live in Chicago, they live in Venice. My mówimy w języku polskim, troszkę po angielsku tylko. We speak Polish, just a little bit of English. Uh, Jacek mówi tylko po angielsku, nie mówi po polsku. Uh, Jacek speaks only English. He does not speak Polish. But when was the last time that Mr. Kowalski made attempts to meet with the side of the family that's in Chicago? Uh, kiedy ostatnim razem pan Kowalski uh, próbował się spotkać z rodziną, która mieszka w Chicago? Uh, Jacek z dziećmi po śmierci Beaty był tutaj dwa razy z wizytą. Uh, after Beata's death, Jacek and the children were here in, were in Chicago twice. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, ma'am. Nie mam więcej pytań, dziękuję. Mr. Anderson, any more questions? Nothing further, Your Honor. Pan Anderson też nie ma więcej pytań. Hold on a second, ma'am. The jury might have questions. Jeszcze pani poczeka, bo być może ławnicy będą mieli pytania. Members of the jury, anyone have questions? Ławnicy nie mają pytań. Czy nie, ponieważ nie ma więcej pytań, czy możemy podziękować e, świadkowi? Thank you for being with us, You're free to go. Dziękuję za to, że pani była z nami. Może pani już skończyć e, swoje zeznanie. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You can Thank down. you, Your Honor. And your next witness. Laura Bowes by deposition. Judge, can we approach briefly? Sure.
And this one's on video as well? This deposition's on video? Yes, Your Honor. Oh, Your Honor, I do ask, I'm sorry, can we tell the jury the date the depositions are taken? Because it's not, can it's we approach? It's on the bottom of the screen, but okay. I think he's going to. Sure, the answer is yes. Let's see if I can do the lights again. Is that too much light over there? Tell me. I, I, I'll, I'll keep adjusting it. I said there's like nine switches here. Or not switches, buttons. Okay, let's play the next deposition, please. No. Judge, should we do an instruction? Or, uh, this may be our first. Is this our first no. depo? No. Oh, yeah. sorry. I'll just tell you the instruction anyway. As a reminder, depositions were done under oath prior to you coming here. Um, you're to treat them just like all the other evidence in this case. There you go. Can you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name for the record. Laura Ann Vos. And is that an MD? DO. Uh, and what the DO stands for again? Doctor of Osteopathy. And at your present hospital, are you on any committees? Yes. What committees? I am on um, the ethics committee. I am on a pediatric surgical performance improvement committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Dr. Post, uh, we are, as I said, in follow up to your, your last deposition, I think your only deposition in this case, which was taken Thursday, November 14th at 2019. Uh, do you remember giving that deposition? Yes. And have you had the opportunity to read that deposition uh, in the interim? Yes. All right. Did you mark out any changes or corrections on an errata sheet? Um, I may, Howard, I would like to defer to Howard whether or not I had fill, filled out one form regarding my cell phone. All right. So that's a maybe? Yes. And during the course of that deposition, I advised you that if at any time you did not understand my question or you're having difficulty answering it, I ask that you tell me out loud on the record so I can change it to make it easier to answer. Do you recall that? Yes. And we agreed that in the event uh, that you did not say anything, we all, judge, jury, all of us could understand you understood the question and are answering it to the best of your abilities, right? Yes. Okay. From 2017 to 2020, basically the time after Maya finally left Johns Hopkins uh, to the time you left Johns Hopkins, did your position change at all? No. Did you continue to work on certain committees? Yes. And what were those committees? Um, not having the list in, in front of me. Um, Best you can do. 
their um, ethics committee. Um, there was a um, a PICU committee. There, um, I would have to actually pull up my CV to to be able to tell you all of the committees that I was on at that time. Okay. Well, the reason I was asking you is that you said in the first text, I think we're going to talk about, you've been busy with an ethics consult. So I take it that as of the time that Beata Kowalski committed suicide, you were on that ethics committee? Yes. The cell phone that we're talking about here, uh, I wanted to read just the last four digits. I didn't want to put the whole thing in the record. Uh, where the, that's the one that is uh, 9979. Uh, that's not my personal cell phone. Okay. I don't uh, you think that that was the, the hospitals? Possibly. Okay. That's the one that appears next to your I take to be your statements here in the text. All right. And what number did you send the texts from? And just for clarification, it is the uh, text that began to be discussed today, learned today that ketamine girl's mom committed suicide yesterday. And right. all I'm trying to establish is whose phone was that, yours or the hospital's? That one was mine. So one of the uh, statements in this is I've been busy with an ethics consult, so I haven't done anything about order sets yet. I wanted to find out more about the uh, ethics committee. Um, was this something where you had calls to, I guess, intervene or to analyze ethical issues? Yes. And so what did you do, not particularly for this one, uh, but in general, when you got a call? We would um, take in the information from whoever requested a consult, um, review the record, talk to all of the parties involved. Um, then we would um, convene a subgroup of the committee mm -hmm. to have people come and present and to view, review the records and involved parties were then excused and the committee then would discuss uh, recommendations. And then and who else was on? if there was an outcome, if there was a decision, a recommendation, who did you make a recommendation to? We would write a formal consult and put it in the chart. What human being within the hospital, if you had uh, to report to management, who would you report to? We um, would fall under the medical executive committee. Um, we also had um, administrative um, management that we uh, reported to as well. Um, so, for example, Joe uh, Perno would have been aware of the ethics committee activities. What was the test to determine whether the ethics committee should consider a case? We would get the re request. Um, we would determine whether or not we um, there was an ethical issue at question. Um, sometimes it would be um, more of a legal issue than a um, ethical issue or um, a communication issue. So we would Was try to certain... address. Sorry, go ahead. We would try to address what the specific ethical question was. To make the cut, so to speak, for committee review. Was there any guidelines? Were there any guidelines for you? In other words, I'm assuming you didn't uh, take up matters involving uh, just a, a disagreement among nurses or, or uh, social workers or anything like that. Would it be something that would involve a doctor as a requirement? 
it would not necessarily have to involve a doctor. It could be anyone was allowed to place a consult or request something to be reviewed. So it could be inter-service related or patient physician related. All right. Um, after the time that you learned that Beata Kowalski had committed suicide, was there an ethics committee convened to review what happened? No. Why not? There was um, no request for one, and we also usually did consults during um, current hospitalizations um, if a case involved a patient. All right, so the, the committee itself never took it upon itself to bring up a matter. It had to have a complainant. We did not bring up this case. Let me try this. How could you decide if something was ethical or unethical if the ethics committee never took it up? Again, there was there was no no request. If there had been a request to look at it, then it would have been um, looked at. If a concern had been raised internally or an external person had asked for something to be reviewed. So the answer is, in that situation, no one would be reviewing the issue. True? It would be reviewed if it was, if it was, had been, if someone had requested a review. Okay. Uh, what about in the three months of Maya's hospitalization preceding the suicide? Did anyone bring up any ethical issues about her care? There were no requests for the ethics committee to evaluate the case. Was there ever any investigation at all of what happened to Maya Kowalski by the ethics committee? No. And after Maya, Maya's mother committed suicide, was there any investigation into the ethics of how she was treated? No. Would you agree with me that using the term ketamine girl is a bit dehumanizing? It basically sort of is a euphemism to not use her name in a, in a text. Um, okay, well, you're not answering my question. In retrospect, wouldn't you say that the term ketamine girl is a bit dehumanizing? Uh, I probably could have used a, a better choice, but I was trying not to use her name. I'm not aware of that. No. Can you say, as you sit here today, that you didn't refer to her as Maya in different conversations to other doctors? On the phone, that is. I'm not aware one way or the other with 100% okay. certainty. How many ketamine girls were there at All Children's at this time? Well, I had used that as a euphemism because it was unique kind of given her, her history. And um, Did you ever refer to her as ketamine girl to her name, to her face? No. To her mother? No. To her father? No. So how is ketamine girl not an identifier if MK is the only girl being kept there because of ketamine? I see it more as an identifier for people that would be familiar with her case, but not something from somebody outside to be able to connect. All right. specifically to a person. 
You're sure that none of the nurses or social workers or other doctors also referred to her as ketamine girl from time to time? I have no idea. All right. You said, uh, sorry to say my prediction was correct. You were predicting Maya's, excuse me, you were predicting Beata's suicide, were you not? Um, prediction probably was not a good word, but more um, related on my previous experience uh, of a case um, during residency. Um, so it may have been more of a, a speculation than a prediction. <laughs> You have a doctorate level education, do you not? Yes. All right. So when you say words, you choose what words are appropriate, do you not? I like to think that I do, but in a just in a text, sometimes you don't think and edit and re-edit. And um, as a as a human, you sometimes use words that probably would not be the best words to use. Okay, so uh, tell us when you say my prediction. Please define my prediction, what it was. I had had a, a previous experience during residency where there was a, um, a child who the court had determined had was um, Munchausen's by proxy and that mother had committed suicide. So it was based on a previous experience. And where did that happen? That happened at All Children's. And when? I believe it was in my internship year, which would have been 1994 to 1995. And... Tell me what the facts were, without mentioning names, obviously, that uh, you believe caused that mother to commit suicide. I don't have the details. I know as a, a resident, I believe I might have seen that child one time in the emergency room, and then there was an investigation and she had committed suicide and that's basically all of the details that I know of that case. Who were you predicting this to? Who was the recipient of this prediction? Um, some of it was my own thoughts and I believe they had maybe a passing conversation after caring for Maya um, with a coworker just saying that I had had a previous experience and that's what had happened. So by the time Biata committed suicide, you had already gone through one with a mother committing suicide, right? I knew of one, yes. Mm -hmm. And you knew the signs of someone who was about to commit suicide from that experience, did you not? I didn't have... Kind of, um, any involvement with that patient or family um, during that period of the investigation and afterwards. I had seen her. And yet it came immediately to mind when you heard that Beata had taken her own life, did it not? It came to mind. Um... All right. Um, and then you uh there is a response or is this you i know we did the right thing but this is really effed up i feel bad is that you or is that miss Tepa, dr Tepa sanchez that's dr Tepa. and did you share her concerns that this was effed up i um i shared my concern that i felt bad about the situation all right, so you felt bad, and then you expressed this uh, by saying, uh, don't know all the details, but I think the courts and the psychiatrists finally called it what it was, 
I had another mother do the same thing. We definitely did the right thing for the child. All right, taking this, this uh, last sentence, we definitely did the right thing for the child. The right thing being what? That I believe that as a group and an organization that we advocated for Maya, raised concerns and allowed the process to continue for the appropriate people to look into what was going on in the hopes of having a good medical outcome for Maya. You do know that Maya did not have a good medical outcome for more than three years and still suffers from pain, do you not? I, I'm not involved with her care, so I don't know directly what's been going on with Maya. Did you ever check on Maya to determine whether this statement was correct? We definitely did the right thing for the child. What do you mean by check on? Call her, follow up in any way. No, talk I didn't. Have... We talked to Dr. Okay. Wassenauer, her, uh, uh, her pediatrician. No, I had no follow up contact with Maya. Did you ever call Dr. Wassenauer to ask him what his feelings were? No. And then it says, OMG, that means, oh my God. Yes. And then, well, I really hope she has a chance of a better life now. Is that you or is that Dr. Tepa Sanchez? That's Dr. Tepa. And did you believe that, that Maya was better off without her mother? I think it's sad when any child loses a, 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 a parent. However, you know, if the investigation was proceeding and found that that was leading to harm for Maya and that Maya, you know, perhaps Maya now would have a better opportunity to have some other, other therapies and not be under the high doses of, of drugs to be able to succeed at school, um, to be able to do well. So you actually believed that Beata Kowalski was doing something harmful to her daughter? I think that, that the process of, of evaluation was underway, and that is that we allowed the, the system to work and the people that were appropriate to make those investigations and determinations were involved. All right. And then it says, well, I really hope she has a better life now. That's, again, Dr. Tepa Sanchez. Yes. Do you have any remorse to this day, uh, evidenced by anything in these text messages? I feel sad about the, the, the whole situation, and I feel um, sad that she chose to take her life. I... Um, but I'm hopeful that Maya now has been able to be more active and participate in her life and do more things. Okay. And you saw her toes, feet turned inward towards each other? The dystonia? I don't recall if I ever examined her feet on night call. You never saw her feet. Okay. When you saw Maya, though, she was perfectly civil and nice to you, was she not? She was, um, we didn't really, she didn't really talk much to me that I recall. Um, she was on her, on her phone the first time I saw her. She was playing on her phone. Um, she did not personally swear at me. You saw her 10 times, and each time that you saw her, she acted like a 10-year-old, 11-year-old girl, did you not? Uh, some of the times she was sleeping. Well, I think 10 and 11-year-old girls sleep occasionally. Correct. So, but the, the point being, your medical records do not reveal any denial of her being in pain. So when you say, let's, let's me see what she does with pain tonight before doing CT, you 
realized that there was, I don't want to call it a threat, but a possibility that my that performing a CT could cause her some discomfort, aggravate the pain in other words. True? Yes, there was a potential for that. Um, so you were the chairman of the ethics committee at this time in 2017, were you not? Yes. Still to this day, there has been no retrospective on what okay, happened. That's a Up to the point that I was at All Children's, there's not been an investigation. I cannot testify to what has happened since I left. Does that complete the plan of the deposition? Yes, sir. Okay, members of the jury, I think this is a good time for a morning break. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. All right. Any issues we need, uh, the jury's out of our presence. Any issues we need to address before we take a break? Do we have the time breakdown on that deposition? That, that was all the plaintiff, Your Honor. Okay, so can you tell me how long it specifically was? Yes, Your Honor. It's 23 minutes and 21 seconds. Okay. Thank you all. We'll be in recess for 10 minutes.
How long is this next deposition? Just a moment, Your Honor. Just as a reminder, at 11.25... It's, it's 20 to 25 minutes. It's again. 22 minutes and 49 seconds. Okay. And who is... Is this all for the plaintiffs? Mm. Or is there a That's split the on this totality. one? totality. I don't recall any defense questions in this one. I think it's all plans. It was 22 and something? 22 minutes and 49 seconds. Okay. And who is this? Dr. Joseph Farno. Are we ready to bring the uh, jury in? I believe so. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, let's bring in the jury. And you get, you're, you're the new lighting director. <laughs> Good luck. Please be seated, everyone. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. And has anyone approached you about this case since you were last with us? Correct. And has, have you seen any media coverage in the last 20 minutes? Okay. Um, plaintiff, let's call your next witness. No, by deposition. Okay. We're going to try to do the lights again. Doctor, if you'll please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Morning, Doctor. Please Morning. state your name for the record. Joseph Perno, P E R N O. And you are a medical doctor? Correct. And where do you work? Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And when did you start there? 2003. Prior to the acquisition of All Children's Hospital by Johns Hopkins? Correct. And that occurred in? 2010 or 11. 
All right. Uh, is it true that you never actually sat on the risk management committee? I don't recall attending in, in 2016 or 2017. So you weren't there, at least as far as you can remember. As far as I could remember. I was a named a member of the committee as chief of staff, but as chief of staff as a volunteer position, I was still working a full clinical load and couldn't attend every meeting I was invited to. So as chief of staff, how did you keep up with what was going on there? Well, as chief of staff, you get invited to every single meeting in the hospital. Um, so, uh, you pick and choose the ones that are important for the role of the medical staff to attend. And I don't recall ever attending the risk management committee. But since you were chief of staff, you had, I am assuming because you're here, some control or management of the risk management committee. No, I had no role other than to attend and listen to what's going on. Well, but how was that information then communicated to you of what happened or what was going to happen? Is there anything the medical staff need to know about? I'm the liaison to the medical staff. They would communicate with me if there's something that was significant for the medical staff to know. Well, I understand that, but how about agendas and decisions and topics and referrals up and that type of information? How were you kept abreast of that? Uh, again, I would only be notified if there was something pertinent that came out of a meeting that they needed addressed with the medical staff. If not, it would. And how would they do that? Probably in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I don't recall anything coming up, but that would be the typical way. Either the BPMA or the president of the hospital would update me. So let me get this straight. Did you ever see any agendas for the risk management meetings? Any of them? Not that I recall. Uh, if I was on the committee, they were probably sent to me, but I don't recall ever seeing them. Do you recall ever seeing any one of them, an agenda for a risk management meeting? Not during that time. Do you recall receiving any, not if you, did you receive any notes, memoranda, or any other documentation, electronic or in writing? of when, what went on in a particular meeting. Okay, I, I honestly do not recall. During the time that this stay of Maya Kowalski was going on October 7th through approximately the 14th of January, 2017, were you aware of what was going on with her? I was, um, and I think we discussed at a previous deposition, I became aware when there was a question about bringing in an outside physician to the organization. And was that the only decision that you were involved in, insofar as Maya's care? Correct. So insofar as being able to answer questions of what went on, what was reviewed, what decisions were made, what recommendations were made at a risk management meeting, you wouldn't know. Correct. Correct. All right. So tell me what you knew or understood about Maya Kowalski's care and the situation. At the time, from what I recall, is they wanted to bring in her personal physician who did not have privileges and the question was, should and how we would give temporary emergency privileges on a case-by-case -case basis. And as chief of staff, I have a role in that decision-making in conjunction with uh, typically the VPMA of the hospital. All right. So there is a method to bring in doctors who don't have privileges on an emergency basis. Is that right? Correct. What are the criteria? So they, they need to be able to, they need to be filling a gap that we do not have on the medical staff. Uh, so there needs to be a need for them. Uh, they need to meet the qualifications of our medical staff um, to treat the patient. They need to be, for emergency privileges, really they're self-limited to a particular case or time period. I don't have it all in front of me, but it's pretty spelled out by joint commission, but those are the, the main crux of it. 
All right. I see two then. They need to fill a gap in an area of medicine that the hospital does not have an expertise in. Correct. And then the second one is they have to have qualifications of medical staff. Translate that for me. Right. They need to be able to be credentialed on our medical staff, meaning they have to meet certain basic things that our medical staff bylaws state you must have. All right. And so is that in writing anywhere? Yes. And what is the name of that document? That would be the medical staff bylaws. All right. And so then we had uh, Dr. Hanna. Do you recall Dr. Hanna as being the subject of your review? Yes. Let's just assume for the purposes of this question, through other des- testimony and circumstances, that the hospital was informed that Dr. Hanna could and would be examining my Kowalski. Um, what effect would that have on the credentialing process? I believe it would have no effect. We would still follow our process as a, a medical staff. It's, it's our job to make sure that people are qualified to treat children. So we would follow the same process. Again, I think it's All speculative. Right. I don't recall that we did that, but. But he could. And if I'm understanding you, visit the patient as a visitor and converse with her, so long as he doesn't physically examine her or treat her, right? Yeah, he could visit her as a friend or a colleague, sure. So if he was turned down at the front desk after applying, or excuse me, even though he didn't apply, but just coming in to see Maya, uh, that would be wrong, would it not? I don't um, have any control over security and their policies. We would follow our normal visitor policies at the time, so I, I can't speak to that. Well, the patient's rights include to talk with another doctor or specialist at your own request and expense. Um, it would appear then that the patient has a right to speak with another doctor at least, is that true? He would be visiting in, in a role of a friend, not as a physician, because he's not credentialed. Okay. Well, so you're saying that to talk with another doctor or specialist uh, at your own request and expense, it has to be on the phone? In the hospital, you must be credentialed to act as a physician. So he could talk to his patient over the phone. He could get emergency privileges and treat her as a physician. But in the building, he needs to be a credential part of the medical staff to care for any patient. Were you aware that there was litigation going on involving Maya Kowalski? Not at that time. That is a shelter hearing, shelter proceeding. I probably knew that she was uh, a shelter hearing, but I don't, I don't, I probably knew. All right. Um, Under those circumstances, then, did you nonetheless look at the doctor's background, training, and experience to determine whether he would have been approved? He never applied or sent it in, so no. He never did any independent research to determine whether or not? I would have no need to do that. I've got a lot of duties, as I described earlier. I don't need to be doing extra work. And as we've established, um, you can't say whether you were advised or not about that. True? Not true? Yeah. But you have a rough idea of what Risk Management Committee did? Yes. What did they do? They look at trends and different things that pose a risk to the hospital. It's a quarterly meeting, so it's not a real time. It's usually retrospecting, looking back what's happened 
infection rates, different risks that may be there. Again, uh, and some of this I know just from reading up on it. Okay. And when you say retrospectively, that means in the preceding quarter? Yes. And when you say quarter, are you talking about, for instance, the typical quarters of January, March, June, October? Yeah, that's that? what I assume that's the frequency. Is it true that the, the, uh, the board, based on the recommendation of the MEC, can allow someone uh, on board onto the hospital to make an examination on an emergency basis without uh, submitting uh, their application for privileges? That's, that is exactly what I was referring to when I talk about emergency privileges. There is a shortened process where we do the basic checks for quality and safety. And yes, it is a recommendation. All medical staff decisions are finalized by the board. But yes, that's the emergency privileging process you're describing. Sorry, I'm going to make a note. Who was there to review what was happening to Maya Kowalski in real time? So there's no need for a review in real time if the care is going well. So the answer is no one. Everyone. We're constantly monitoring our quality of care through multiple indicators, whether it's frontline staff, physician staff, resident staff, we're constantly looking at it. So if there's no red flags, there's no need to do a, a review of every single case. What's a red flag? If there's a concern with the care that we're giving. Give me some examples. Uh, if there's a concern for inappropriate medication use, prolonged stay in the hospital, discharging too soon, uh, inappropriate floor, meaning need a higher level of care, Something along those lines, those are some generalities of things we're always keeping an eye on. All right, let me ask you about some different things and ask you whether they would meet the threshold for the first, the uh, risk management committee, and we'll work through the other ones. Um, a patient such as Maya Kowalski being kept by the hospital against her and her parents' will for seven days. Would that reach the threshold of something that would be reviewed by risk management? And no, I mean, risk management committee meets quarterly, so that would not be appropriate. So would it be reviewed retrospectively? I do not know. Would it be reviewed by the patient safety committee? Probably not. Would it be reviewed by the Standards and Credentialing Committee? Definitely not. Uh, the, can you think of any other committees that might review a patient being kept against their will at the hospital? A, I don't believe we keep patients against their will, uh, but it would probably be more of a team meeting with the care team and the family to discuss best process. All right. Um, the patient being prohibited from seeing her priest, would that meet the threshold for the risk management committee? Again, the risk management committee doesn't function in real-time decisions. It's a quarterly meeting. Well, then who at the hospital checks to make sure that the floor staff the doctor is actually involved, are doing the right thing. So we have risk managers who are involved on a day-to-day -day basis that will interact with the staff as necessary. We have social workers for scenarios that you're kind of leading towards uh, that would work together with the care team to make sure we're giving the highest quality care. What if it's the social worker who's actually doing 
the things that are highly questionable, if not illegal. We have physicians, we have risk managers would be involved, and, and I would like to say our social workers don't perform illegal activities. Who makes the decisions or oversees decisions about compliance with court orders? I would say that's probably our risk management department. So in terms of, let's just say, there are facts in the record that Maya Kowalski's priest was prohibited from seeing her in the hospital. You would agree that that violates Maya Kowalski's rights. I, I wouldn't necessarily agree to that, and I don't know why um, the priest was denied, but I wouldn't agree to that. Okay, so who was there then to review the actions of a nurse or a doctor or a social worker who came up with something like that out of their own head? Who was the next level to check to see whether that was appropriate standard of care? It would be a, probably a team decision between the caregivers, the social work, the nursing staff, and again, likely risk management in this scenario. And who's the superior to risk management? I don't know. I would guess our legal counsel, but I don't know. I'm not in that. Department. And who does your legal counsel report to? At that time, it was the president. And other than the board of directors, was the president the highest authority at the hospital? Yes, the president at the hospital, yes. Let's ask about the child being stripped down to her underwear, short shorts, uh, against her will, and photographs being taken of her without any court authorization, any authorization or notice to the parents, and against both the parents and the child's will. Would that be the type of thing that would meet the risk management threshold? No, because I would consider that part of our, our standard care and treatment plan. Uh, we often will take pictures of patients to document for the medical record. Make sure I get this right, standard of care. So Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, standard of care, could include stripping a child down to her underwear and photographing her in a private room against the child's will, against the parent's will, and without notice to the parents, and without any court order or legal authority to do so. Am I correct in that? I think the legal authority is the consent to treat. It's part of a treatment protocol. Uh, many children object to things we do for them, right? If I'm suturing a child in the ER, they object. If they we put an IV in their arm, they object. So uh, a child's objection, I, I, I think, is difficult. We work with them. Uh, but, yeah, it's taking non-patient identifiable pictures to help with the medical record, whether it's bruising, whether it's rashes, whether it's injury, uh, it, it helps enhance the medical record. So it's part of a standard treatment plan. But in every one of those circumstances, the parents are notified and give their consent. True. We have consent to treat. So once they give us consent to treat and examine, that's all part of a physical exam and, and treatment plan. So yeah, that consent had been already given. Well, can... The doctors put a child into a surveillance room for 48 hours under false pretenses of testing without parent consent. Yeah, I think we choose rooms for our families all the time without consenting families. And if we feel it's part of the treatment plan, I, I, I don't see that as a separate call out either. What possible benefit to the child is it to put them in a room where they cannot reach the commode for 48 hours knowing the child cannot walk 
and keeping her in that darkened room for that length of time. Are you asking about a, this specific patient? I can't speak to about this specific patient. And I, I'm not sure exactly what you're trying to get at. When is Baltimore consulted in terms of standard of care? It, um, very rarely. Um, and in 2016, probably never. But the point is Johns Hopkins in Baltimore was not monitoring the level of care that you were providing down here. True? Correct. And they were not influencing it anyway, correct? Correct. Are you aware from any source other than your attorney that Beata Kowalski committed suicide? No. So to this day sitting here, you're not aware that Beata Kowalski killed herself and left suicide notes which blamed Johns Hopkins' level of care. Are you aware or not? Are you aware? I have no knowledge from outside sources. Okay. Did you ever speak with any of the physicians that were involved in, the, in Maya Kowalski's care while she was there or soon after? Just in regards to what we discussed with the potentially bringing in an outside physician. Okay, so uh, in that limited conversation, then I take it that you never learned that there were texts back and forth predicting Beata's suicide, right? I have no knowledge of that. And you would agree with me, though, that if a Johns Hopkins physician is aware that a patient or visiting parent is a suicide risk, that is something that risk management should consider. Yes. Yeah, so it's kind of an abrupt end, but that's the end. Okay. Are we have another deposition or? We do. I'm sorry. Yes, we do. So I'll leave the lights as is. And your next. Uh... Uh, the next deposition is Dr. Anthony Napolitano. Uh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. If, if there's a question, go ahead and write it out. And Mr. Whitney, while the jurors writing out are from a timing perspective, are we okay with the next deposition? I think you said the breaking point is 1130. Is that right? 1125. It, it will be fine. Doctor, would you raise your hand for me, please? Hold on a second. Do you so, that's a question. <coughs> Looks like there are a lot more. Are there other questions? I'm sorry. Okay, members of the jury, uh, one of your number had uh, a couple of questions. Uh, obviously, with a deposition, I don't have a live witness here that can answer that. But the, as you've seen, the attorneys are very aware of the questions that were raised. And I suspect they will address it in due course. 
And uh, let's proceed with the playing. Of, hey, before I, is the lights okay? Do we need to dim it down some more? Okay, thank you. Let's proceed. Doctor, would you raise your hand for me, please? Do you swear a firm testimony you're about to give the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, stuff you got? I do. Okay. Please state your name for the record. Anthony Napolitano. Dr. Napolitano, do you understand that you are appearing pursuant to a directive by the court that uh, the defendants produce someone with knowledge regarding the risk management committee operations and issues regarding the chain of command and control? Yes. And have you ever served on the risk management committee? Yes. What years? Um, I would say I would say 2014 through uh, 2019. And what was your position, if any? I served as chair of the Department of Pediatrics. Who else in 2016 was on the committee with you? It would be the chair of the Department of Surgery and members of the risk management team. And say, I, I, you're, you're real soft. Can you uh, speak up a little bit on this? Sure. It would be uh, Dr. Kalambani, the chair of pediatric surgery, and members of the risk management team. And who is that at that time? I, I don't remember all the names. It would be um, Jackie Crane would be the name I remember. And she was the general counsel? I believe she was. Can you tell this jury, from the best of your memory, whether the risk management committee of Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital ever <laughs> took corrective action in any way about Maya Kowalski's considerations and situation? Not that I'm aware. Not that I'm, I am aware. How does risk management manage risk in real time? We go back to our divisions and our care areas and look to see how we can help. So you do or do not discuss things happening in real time? No. No, you do not. We do not discuss real time. So if a physician or a group of younger physicians makes a mistake, to the best of your knowledge, there's no one at the hospital that is there to correct them in real time. It's not in real time. There was no one there that was reviewing what the hospital was doing in real time, correct? In real time, no. So, for instance, if you had a social worker who was acting inappropriately towards a child patient, there was no mechanism by which risk management would intervene and try to stop that behavior. True? No. Did you know anything about, uh, doctor, did you know anything about what happened with Maya Kowalski? I, I read about it. I read the article about two weeks ago. But before that, as a member of the Risk Management Committee, you'd heard nothing? I had heard nothing about the case. And what other positions did you hold during 2016, 2017? What other committees and things were you on? The Department of Medicine. What was your position? I was a chair of the Department of Medicine, Pediatric Medicine. 
And in that capacity, you didn't hear anything about Maya Kowalski? No. All right, what else were you on? What other committees and organizations were you on? I would sit on a medical executive committee. And as a member of the medical executive committee, you didn't hear anything about Maya Kowalski? No. To the best of your knowledge, did anyone from the quality department, such as a vice president of quality, report to the medical executive committee about Maya Kowalski? No. Do you have any idea why you, as the chief uh, uh, the Department of Medicine chair, would not know about a child being kept at the hospital for this long or three months involving court orders? and an eventual suicide of the mother? The care is managed at the uh, division level. Managed at the what? The care is managed at the division or the treating doctor level with their care. It doesn't, doesn't come up to me. I would not hear day-to-day -day operations or care like this. What remedies were available to the patient, most likely the patient's, parents, if the doctors at the treating doctor level were misdiagnosing or otherwise negligent in their care of the patient? Check the form. They would ask to speak with the division chief and ask to sit down and speak with him or her to discuss the concerns they had. All right. And with Maya Kowalski, uh, they're under allegations of child abuse. Who would be, who would that fall under as a division chief? That would, um, for the care or for the, uh, for the care of the patient? Yes. That would be the division chief of uh, hospitalist medicine. So... I know you didn't learn of it till recently, but you do know Maya was there under a court order, correct? My, my knowledge is really from uh, what I know from reading the uh, uh, US Today, USA Today article that I read. Okay. And who was responsible then for assuring Maya's care was aligned or complied with a court order. That would be the, the physicians caring for Maya. And if the physicians were not monitoring the nurses and errors were made in her care, how would that be corrected? So the child was no longer injured, hurt, or troubled. It would be the nursing manager of the, of the floor that Maya was on. As chair of uh, pediatric medicine, do the hospitalists belong to your department, pediatric medicine? The one of several divisions, yes. The ones that what? Yes, they would. They, that... The hospital is speak, um, well under the Department of Medicine. All right. And so during 2016, who were some of the hospitalists that were under your authority, if you will? At that point in time, and this is reading from the article with the, uh, I think, Dr. Deese. It's one that I read. And um, who was it? Sorry. Dr. Deese. Okay. Anyone else? Right. Dr. Major? She would be a hospitalist, yes. 
let's see, how about Dr. Young? Dr. Young, yes. Dr. Carroll? Yes. Dr. Davidson? Danielson, excuse me. I'm sorry, Danielson. Dr. The first name on Danielson is who? Kristen. Kristen. Would be a hospitalist, yes. So she'd be under your care, or your under hospitalist. Okay. And throughout this period of time in the fall of 2016, did any of your hospitalists that we've mentioned here ever come to you with any concerns about the actions of any fellow doctors, nurses, or social workers? No. If they had come to you and said, the patient's complaining that she's being tortured every time she has to do this type of physical therapy, uh, what would be the procedure? Uh, that's an example. What would be the procedure then once you received that report? I would speak to the uh, division chief to understand what was happening as for reporting what's happening. Well, who is the division chief for that? What division are we talking about? The hospitalists. Well, who was the division chief in 2016 while all this was going down? I, I don't remember. I have to go back. We have to go back and look. To the best of your knowledge, has Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital done anything to change the way it operates? since Beata Kowalski's death, Maya's stay there? No. In fact, most of the doctors, nurses, and staff like you don't even know what went down, do you? From the, from the article that I read is how I know about it. But internally, coming from within the hospital, nobody ever brought to your attention what happened there. Is that right? Uh, no. Okay. And who was there to make sure that the pa patient's rights, as stated in the on this particular document, um, the guide for patients and families, who was there to make sure that the patient's rights under that were being upheld, honored, if you will? The, uh, the uh, local uh, leadership, the managers of the, of the unit, the nursing managers of the unit, and the physician, the division chief. Well, you just testify now that you don't treat adults. Who there is qualified to diagnose a parent as having a mental illness? We, uh, we don't have adult providers at the hospital. So we, we really do not manage adult care. I take it the answer to your question is, there isn't anyone there that is qualified to diagnose adult psychiatric issues. Yes. And that was true in 2016, correct? Yes. That's it. Then we announced the date. It's a bit hard to read on that deposition. I don't think it's still going. No, it's still going. It's still going. Oh, it is. All right. So, <laughs> Long I'm going to ask you now about some allegations you, you haven't heard from your testimony, other than popular media, 
and uh, ask you whether these comply with, with hospital policy. Um, Maya's priest was prevented from seeing her. Does that comply with hospital policy? I'm not aware. Okay, she was prevented from having a computer or any electronic devices. Is that uh, part of the hospital's policy generally with children? Not being allowed to have any food, any baked goods from parents or even her little friends. Is that hospital policy? If a patient was on a specific diet, potentially. To strip her to her underwear, short shorts, and physically hold her down to photograph her. Is that part of high, uh, hospital policy? I'm, uh, I'm unaware. All right. What about listening in on calls with her lawyer? That hospital policy? I'm unaware. Do you report to anyone in Baltimore? No. Have you ever? No. Is it true that the hospital, all children's, continue to operate with essentially the same staff and same uh, procedures and same level of care? after Johns Hopkins bought it, as before Johns Hopkins bought it? Yes. If there is a truly egregious event at the hospital, and I assume there has to have been some over your tenure, what is the most direct line to the president? I'd go to the president of Johns Hopkins Old Children's. Okay. Do all department heads have access directly to the president? At that point in time? In yes. 2016? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what, what divisions are part of your department? At that time? Sure. So it would be the um, cardiology, hematology, oncology, critical care, hospitalist medicine, genetics, infectious disease, neurology, um, rheumatology. Well, if you had, uh, in, then you would have had control over all of the doctors we mentioned from one department or the other, would you not? I'd have a, a good deal on the medical side. All right. And, and then how often would you have a meeting in 2016 with the uh, heads of the departments? We would try to meet monthly. Not everybody would attend, but we try to meet monthly. And in terms of the discussions, do you recall... Any discussions, even in the general terms, about a child that was being held by court order in the hospital for a long period of time? No, that would not come up in the division meeting. How many times have you ever heard of a child being kept at your hospital for over three months against their will? I, I'm not aware of that. And so still, if that in fact is true, that that was the circumstance, Maya was being held for over three months against her will and her parents' will at the hospital. That was not a significant enough event for any of the department heads to bring up? No. I see. So it doesn't really matter if the child feels that they're a prisoner, the patients feel the child is a prisoner, you're going to stick to your, uh, what did you call it, methods of care? Yes. I don't 
don't think it, I'm premature this time. And this was from May 11th, 2023? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Can I see the attorneys for a moment? We're going to go ahead and take uh, lunch now, and th this is one of a, a meeting that was pre-planned that I had, so it's the fault's on me. Um, I'm going to ask Deputy Coley if you could have them back ready to go at 1 p.m. Uh, we've got a full afternoon, so please be ready for a full afternoon. Uh, do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information, and we'll see you back at 1 p.m. Okay, thank you, everyone. Please be seated. So everyone knows we will be back um, at 12.15. Now, I do have another 12 or 13 minutes if, if you want to just start, or do you want to just take lunch That's now? Fine, Judge. I'm happy to start. do that. Okay. Yeah, because I've got about 12, 12 or 13 minutes. And the, the time on that last deposition hour was 19 minutes and 34 seconds. That okay. was just the one about Dr. Perno. I don't think 
I'm sorry? Did they give the time on Dr. Perno? I didn't think so. It was 22 and like 40-something seconds. Yeah. Okay. okay. And the one before that was 23 and 21 okay. seconds. Sorry. So I've got my list. Well, we'll just start and then we'll pick it back up at 12.15. We do have one motion we'd like to have heard before the afternoon witness, Your Honor. You want to go ahead and do that one right now? Uh, BJ, uh, maybe longer than 10 minutes. Um, oh, we, if it's going to be longer than 10 minutes, we probably... Okay. Well, what, what's the motion? It's a motion to limit or exclude Dr. Porkman's testimony. Oh, we haven't seen that. Got filed two days ago. Well, perhaps they can look at it over lunch and then be ready to talk about it. So, I guess right. it's back to you, Mr. Whitney, about exhibits. Thank you. I'm going to start on the back page of the exhibit list we provided. Um, and again, this is under the risk management file, which is exhibit 2277. And um, I'd like to focus on pages 630 to 631. You can Your Honor, the, the email on the bottom half of the page was previously admitted with redactions. Oh, yeah. But we would so we could redact the entirety of that from this email if necessary. But we would like to admit the top email from New Year's Eve with with redactions, of course. So when you say the top one, are you talking about the one at 219, talking about a transfer? Um, or the one yes, at... yes, I'm sorry. Those, those two. That, starting with that one, which is two lines, and then up to the top, that exchange. was the status of the court order it said if I remember correctly at this time it allowed Johns Hopkins to um, supervise the call specific that's correct within it Your Honor, the, the relevance of this email is that Johns Hopkins has repeatedly taken the position that they were doing everything they could to transfer this child out of there. And that's the nature of the two lines at 2.19 p.m. It has nothing to do with, it's a medical transfer, it has nothing to do with a court order. And the top email, the first line of that email, uh, reveals the type of attitude that was being expressed to other facilities about this potential transfer. So it's relevant and necessary for us to uh, push back on the idea that they were doing what they could accept transfer. Anything else, uh, Ms. Quarles? I just disagree with their aspersions and characterization of the email. They're trying to interpret, and presuming they're going to try to interpret for the court, what it means is not yet once they get wind of issues with the family. I mean, that's having to do with the dependency court. This is what we're going to do now. The bottom email, the one at 6, 12 p.m., either you need to redact it in its entirety or redact it consistent with how we previously redacted the, the predecessor email. Understood. 
the one at 219 that starts with thanks for the update, that entirety, those two sentences, or those three sentences will be unredacted. Those will come in. I'm sorry, redaction. I'm not following. Oh, there. Okay. And up at the top, uh, the first loop, the first line, which is three sentences, that will remain in. Um, and the remainder redacted. Well, the only the answer is almost yes, but this concept about Maya's recent scratch is self inflicted, that isn't dependency related. Right. Um, I think the sentence, plus we are exercising our right to listen in on the calls the best we can due to Maya's recent scratch is self-inflicted, can stay in, because we're going to have uh, an instruction that tells them as of this date that there was authority for Johns Hopkins to supervise the calls. May I read that, that sentence to you, Judge? Mother shall have an... I'm sorry, I didn't... May I, it's just a sentence. Number two of the order. No, no, it's, it's the sentence. Plus, we are exercising our right to listen in on the calls the best we can due to Maya's recent scratches self-inflicted. That sentence would remain in. Who's taking notes as to? I've got the notes. I have the email here and I have the notes on the redactions and I will make it happen over lunch. Anything else about this email? I'm not sh Did you redact the rest? I wasn't okay. sure. The, the only thing that's coming in on that very top top email, this 739 email. Can we have it the, large again, please? And Mr. Ray, thank you. Is the very first line which comprises three sentences, the one that starts not yet once. That whole line stays in. And then the only other um, sentence that will remain in is the sentence that says, plus we are exercising our right to listen in on the calls the best we can due to Maya's recent scratches self-inflicted. Everything else will be redacted. Your Honor, this is a bit nitpicky, but the two signatures that just say sent from my iPhone, can we keep those? Uh, can you scroll down so I can see what it says? Just says at the bottom of the screen here, sent from my iPhone. That's fine. That's not dependency court related. Okay. Thank you. And then, of course, the next email in that chain, the 219 email, will stay in. And then the email below that, we will redact consistent with the previous rule. Exactly. And so when you tender a the redacted version, this will be called 2277-630A uh, and 631A. And so the court will receive the A version as redacted. Judge, we, I, I just like to reiterate our objection. This is we're going deeper and deeper down the DCF and dependency rabbit hole. And, I, I and don't think so, Mr. Particularly Hunter. in light of the last two depositions and the, the court's ruling on, rulings on our objections. So I, I, I feel constrained to put that on the record, Judge. We're, we're parsing a course that can't be parsed. And I, 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 I just have to object to it. And, and, and I appreciate it. And, and let me just give you my rationale, and then I've got to run. Um, there are obviously causes of action that I have not allowed in because of Chapter 39 immunity. I don't have that order in front of me. I don't have the buzzwords in front of me. But it was um, you know, anything that was as a consequence of the call and the actual dependency hearing is you know, obviously a consequence of the call. And I think I've been very clear about that. But there are other counts including the medical malpractice, because uh, Maya was a patient 
at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital concurrent to the time of the uh, dependency court action. And there's also other counts, including the outrage count, negligent infliction of emotional distress, plus others. And so there are there is evidence that could be down the dependency court, but also is relevant to uh, the other causes of action. And what I have been attempting to do is wherever I can to excise out anything that is purely dependency court. Um, but if it's something that goes to a medical malpractice or one of the other counts in this case, even if it's specifically or, or somehow references the dependency action, I'm leaving it in because the jury already knows about the existence of the dependency action. They're going to be instructed, and we've already somewhat instructed them, that the hospital is not responsible for uh, Maya Kowalski being there and could not discharge her against a court order. So I don't believe that the evidence that has been coming in is uh, improper given the uh, causes of action that are actually pled that are outside of the Chapter 39 immunity. And with that, uh, Mr. Alton Byrne, you get 15 I, I, seconds. And then no, I'm that's all I need. I, I just got to say, I, I need to review. Your, we've been doing a, the objections and your rulings on the depositions in this kind of the wholesale fa fashion, so I don't get to see all of this. But there was a massive amount of information in Dr. Politano's deposition about being held prisoner and this and that and the other thing. And keeping in mind that count 14 is only a negligent training count, there was things way beyond that. And then we're talking about things that appear to be going to punitive damages that are after the fact conduct. None of that is admissible for punitive damages. So there's just a pile of things that got in in that deposition that you know, I, I, I respectfully think are error. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. I Assuming that those questions were designated as objectionable. Yeah. Yes, and that's what but I want. Some of them were, but then there were some of them in there that didn't. That, that sounded to me like I don't remember reading any of that. So I think some of what you're talking about wasn't actually designated. But I mean, I, I've been trying to rule the way I just articulated it just a, a moment ago. I mean, that's what I did last night with Doctor Is it Newberger? I mean, I sustained a whole bunch, but I let in some stuff. I cut pieces and, you know, look, I, I, I found I'm, I'm doing everything I can to be fair to both sides with the causes of action that are allowed, those that are not allowed, and that, that's the way I'm going to continue to roll on it. Certainly before Dr. Corkin's testimony, I, I filed a motion, I think, on Sunday of trying to limit some things as to relevance because of these things, and we haven't really been able to hear that. Well, I think that's I think what Mr. Hunter said, and I said that we were going to need to do it, and I really need yes, to, I know. Yes, to, sure. to go. Judge, Judge Moreland is on time all the time. <laughs> Bye now.
going to address, folks. Judge, it would be the uh, motion to limit Dr. Corcoran's testimony that we made reference to before the break. And at some point again, Judge, if you've had the chance to review it, though, Williams' motion, we have to find out about those. Well, Mr. Hunter has the floor right now. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, we've made a motion to limit or exclude the testimony of Dr. Joseph Corcoran. The basis of the motion, um, the main thrust of the motion is exclusion, and it is uh, based on section 766.102, paren 7 of our statutes. Um, as Your Honor has uh, heard before in this matter, uh, Section 766.102 provides for the qualifications under which uh, testimony may be offered by an expert witness in a medical malpractice case. A threshold requirement is that the uh, expert witness have reviewed under subsection 5 of the statute all pertinent medical records, which this witness has testified he has not done. Above and beyond that, however, and more importantly, the thrust of this motion, under section 766.102, paren 7, uh, anyone who is testifying in a medical negligence action against a hospital or health care facility may give expert testimony on the appropriate standard of care or other non-clinical issues administratively if he has substantial knowledge by virtue of his or her training or experience concerning the standard of care among hospitals of the same type as the health care facility or hospital whose acts or omissions are the subject of the testimony and which are located in the same or similar medical communities. Now, I paraphrased the statute there, Judge, but the, the thrust of the statute is that the threshold substantively for the uh, for the competence of an expert to testify on administrative and non-clinical matters against a hospital is the question of whether they have substantial knowledge and experience in the same type of hospital. This witness has never practiced in a children's hospital outside of medical school over 30 years ago. He has never been a CMO of a, medical, uh, of a children's hospital. His experience as a CMO or senior executive official in a hospital setting comes as a result of having served as a CMO chief medical officer uh, in a general hospital, a children's hospital, a general hospital of a different type in a different medical community than all children's hospital in St. Petersburg. He's in the room. We asked the doctor to excuse. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Corcoran, if you could wait outside, please. Okay. Judge, that's the thrust of the argument. The record has established through his deposition testimony that he's not familiar with the different levels of licensure under Florida statutes for different types of hospitals. He is uh, not familiar with the differences in uh, specialty as opposed to non-specialty institutions. He has no familiarity with the disease processes here at issue among pediatric patients. In fact, he's testified he's not a pediatrician. He's never been a pediatrician. He has no knowledge of the diagnosis or treatment of CRPS, the use of ketamine, or any of the other clinical issues that are at issue here. He is, by training, a osteopathic board-certified OBGYN with no pediatric credentials whatsoever, who has never practiced significantly in a pediatric hospital. Do pediatric hospitals use a different coding system than other hospitals? Coding system in what respect? For billing purposes. I, I'm not aware that they, that they are, but on the other hand, he's never been provided their billing records. Yes, it is. Yep, he yeah. sure has. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Not according to his deposition. That's what we have, Judge, and, and the, the alternative part of the motion is 
that his testimony be limited to those matters with respect to which he can furnish familiarity. Uh, if Your Honor is suggesting that perhaps if he's properly informed regarding billing, that would be a potential exception. When, but as a matter of statement, when, when here, was this deposition taken of Dr. Corcoran? Deposition was taken, Dr. Corcoran, sometime recently. August first, twenty twenty-three. He was the one that uh, Your Honor let them add late at the last minute. It was taken like I. You said August. That's probably yeah. That sounds right. August what? August first. And so this motion is coming in. On get the transcript the, before the deadline. Transcripts can be had in a day or two. I, I, I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering why, because we had so many of these hearings before trial. Why, when, when we are with lots of people here and people ready to go to testify that we're having this conversation now as opposed to, you know, the day or, or the week before trial even started? Why, why wasn't it filed by then? we would file it at a point where we had a complete picture of what he had reviewed and we had the opportunity to put it together. And when the deposition was on it, August 1st. Other... I'm sorry? I said if the deposition was on August 1st, why wait two months to file the motion? The, the, the reality is you want me to make a, a decision which you know these motions take a lot longer than the snap amount of time that I'm, I'm being given on this. Judge, in years past, we would make this motion after Bordiring the witness at the time on the witness stand. I don't know. I, how, how many motions in limine to exclude various doctors and opinions have we had we had, this case. Judge, we had a number of them. We had a number of those in, Ju in June, July, and July, and others in August. This doctor got deposed late. He never he never got a report to us till very late. And we his report was timely on June 10th, 2023. I'm going to hear from, from your side in a moment. I don't know what to do, Mr. Hunter, because I feel like I'm being jammed on this. I mean, he's here, everyone's waiting, and, and you're asking me to make really substantive, substantial rulings on things that I would have liked to have actually had some time to think about and to, you know, read it in more detail. Judge, I regret making you feel that way. That's not my intention. There, there's, a, there's a number of us getting jammed about a number of things in this matter. <coughs> Mr. Whitney, what's on your side? The relevant section of the statute is 766. Well, well, first off, tell me what this doctor is going to be testifying to. Let's let's start fundamentally. Well, that's probably better, Mr. Anderson. Question. He is a hospital administration expert, Your Honor. He has analyzed the rules, procedures, routines, um, forms, releases, and the uh, internal <coughs> documents of Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. He is offering opinions about the failure of the systems within the hospital to prevent many of the situations that happened here, including Kathy Beatty and my, uh, treatment of Maya Kowalski and the overall treatment of her through her stay. He is opining as to whether the hospital had sufficient control to advertise itself as Johns Hopkins all Children's Hospital, given the fact, as just testified to by, I believe, either Dr. Perno or Napolitano, that there's absolutely no control whatsoever uh, over them by the uh, Baltimore uh, company. Uh, 
the, he's also testifying about the lack of training um, in the first part. In the second part, she probably shouldn't have even been anywhere near uh, Maya Kowalski in light of the aggressive, the memo regarding aggressive behavior and the extent to which the uh, aggressive behavior was known and how unusual it is for the type of uh, report that was filed against Ms. Beatty to be in a hospital and the fact of threats of physical violence by one employee upon another are a very grave allegation in a hospital, particularly a pediatric hospital. Uh, he will testify and, and thus that Ms. Beatty should have been sent back if they wanted to keep her for, for significant training, which they failed to do, or she should have been released, or at the very least, she should not have been put in to be whatever you want to call her towards Maya Kowalski uh, with very little control. He's going to testify to what you heard from Dr. Perno and Dr. Napolitano, the fact that there was absolutely no real-time uh, review uh, or risk management of events as they happened or within close proximity of them happening sufficient to put a halt to things that were ongoing. He will testify to this was a uh, uh, fox guarding the hen house situation because of the way that Johns Hopkins has set up its monitoring system such that you had people who worked together uh, all the time um, if not totally, were counted on to report about each other in the event there was any violation of Johns Hopkins' internal rules. Uh, he'll testify concerning the internal policies and procedures of Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Uh, instances include their elopement uh, uh, routine, um, their uh, two or three their minor leaving AMA routine, their uh, failure to express the patient and family rights and comply with them in the handling of the Kowalskis. That is a summary of his testimony, and it is set forth not only in his deposition, but in his report. Um, i find the date of the report. Uh, it was filed timely. It was co-counsel has stated, but he filed that and he also filed, the court may recall, an affidavit, I believe, in support of punitive damages in which he went over many of these uh, points, I think almost all of these points, uh, and that affidavit is uh, April 12, 2023, prior to one of the final motions on that. So the defense has had an opportunity to receive a report, an affidavit, and depose him extensively, at which point he covered these issues. All of the things he's testifying to are in evidence. If you need further on the statutory argument, please let me know. I'm still trying to, to, to read and that's why I say I got jammed on this one. It's, I don't know how you want me to do a, a, a quality job at making well thought out decisions without giving me the time to do it. I mean, I can make rulings, but it's, I, I like trying to think through what what's being requested of me, get a chance to actually like read the depositions and I'm still trying to read his report right this second. Judge, I appreciate that. Some of the stuff that you're hearing is clearly outside of the pleadings that are that are, have been have been put forward. Uh, the count eleven, for example, has has been walked away, a walked back. Uh, he, he's he's being put forward as an all purpose expert regarding a, a, a very limited specialty hospital. And, and that, I suppose, is the point. And I, I apologize, but I didn't, I didn't perceive that as being a, a, a matter that required that much forethought. And if, 
that's if that's my bad, that's my bad. Well, if, if you're making the argument that he has never been the chief administrative officer of a specific children's hospital, and, and you're contending that that is the requirement under sub seven of the statute for him to be qualified, is that the argument you're making? Yes, sir. I'm making the argument that this that a, a, someone who's going to criticize the standard of care of a specialty hospital under the statute needs to have substantial knowledge and experience demonstrated of, of their uh, ability to know and be familiar with the standard of care for the same hospital. That's the clear black letter law of the statute. What, what do the cases say interpreting the statute? Since there's very, there's very few cases that interpret this statute as opposed to the statute under 766.102 for N5. No. But under 102 for N5, the cases are very clear that it's got to be that the, the expert witness against or for whom uh, a witness is, being, is testifying has to be in the same specialty. This requirement is essentially the same thing as applied to hospitals. Your Honor, subsection 7 begins, notwithstanding subsection 5. Can, can, considering that I wasn't given the opportunity really to think about this or review, can someone give me a case interpreting the statute so I can actually see what courts case, are, have said about this statute? The primary case they cited, the only case they cited, is Santa Lucia versus Levine at 198 Southern 3rd 803. And that case does not discuss this is the relevant statute. It doesn't even discuss 766-102. It discusses a separate part of the statute under 766-103. So actually, we don't yet have a case. There are actually two cases we cited, Judge. Neither one of them construes this particular subsection of the statute. That's why I said what I said a moment ago. The point, however, is that under this statute, which was amended in 2013 to require the similar, it tightened the similar health care provider requirement for giving expert testimony and required expressly that you have to have an orthopedic surgeon, for example, to testify against an orthopedic surgeon. What, what was the law right? number? I'm sorry? What was the law number that was the change? I, I mean, these are things that I would normally have done so I can actually understand what the legislature has done. The, so the laws of Florida citations were 2013-108 and 2011-233. And I believe the latter one in 2013 is the one that tightened the seminar health care provider provisions of subsection 5. Your Honor, if I may. So 213-108 laws of Florida. Doesn't say what you said it says. So what's the next one? 2011. 2011. Sorry. I, I don't know what to do, Mr. Mr. Hunter. I don't feel like I am ready to make a decision on this issue. It's 
I, I, I feel this is way too late. I, I mean, it, it, just looking at the statute, what, what you're saying is because he has never been a pediatric hospital administrator, he is not eligible to, to qualify under the statute. I think you're probably reading the statute a little too narrowly, but again, I haven't had a chance to, to do it. So if, if I have to make an on-the-fly decision, I'm going to overrule that because you know you haven't shown me any case law that would, would construe it that way. Or and if I got to make a decision without any chance of reflection, then I'm going to say no. Judge, I would simply point out to you that the plain language of the statute substantial knowledge and experience with respect to a to the same type of hospital that's the purpose of the statute as obvious on its face that's the objection we were making well I don't we believe the word objection. same is in the statute I'm sorry no. okay. your honor it, it does say of the same type as the hospital in subsection 7. I wanted to clarify the factual point, which is that same or similar communities, and it was he was the head of what Brandon. He was the head of Brandon, correct? And it's all part of Tampa had, Bay. He was the chief medical officer of Brandon Hospital, which has a pediatric hospital within it. And in fact, he affiliated and collaborated with Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in establishing the standard of care of Brandon. Is that true? Not to my knowledge. If he, if he, he certainly didn't say that in his deposition. He did testify in his deposition that at Brandon, his hospital, not him, he didn't service the contract, his hospital hired pediatric ER doctors and, and pediatric uh, neonatal intensivists to come in and, and run portions of their hospital. But he also said that he had nothing to do with, with either making or servicing those contracts. So I, I don't construe that as assisting them in making the standard of care. If Your Honor will look at the statute, it, it's, it's a matter of his having knowledge and experience in the same type of hospital and in a similar community. It's, it's a two-pronged test. Now, the, the, the similar community is, is wishy-washy here, but the same type of hospital or. is clear. I'm sorry? It says or, right? Not and. It says or. It says the substance testimony and which are located in the same or similar communities at the time of the alleged act giving rise to the cause of action. And, and if you're suggesting that Hillsborough County and, and Pinellas County are, are not the same or substantially the same. No, sir, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying that, that, they're, that what I'm suggesting is that the same type of hospital is the primary standard here. And he has not demonstrated that level of knowledge. This, this would so you agree it's the same community? Yes, sir. Okay, so you're only talking about... Same type of hospital. And, and, and Judge, with all due respect, this objection would be perfectly appropriate at the time he offered the opinion. Except that the court said prior deadline. Just focusing for a moment on the or that the court points out same or similar communities, in addition to being the chief medical officer of Brandon and the pediatric hospital there, and affiliate with Johns Hopkins in those efforts. He was also the division chief medical officer for HCA Far West Division, and he oversaw Sunrise Children's Hospital in Las Vegas. So uh, Las Vegas and Tampa are substantially similar. Well, they both have football teams. <laughs> both had John Gruden as a coach. I, I would suggest to you that they're the similarity then, Your Honor. Where else has this doctor been? Remind me. Hospital Corporation of America. Yeah, he's been an executive with HCA Hospital Corporation of America. In that role that I just mentioned, he was the division chief medical officer. I think he'll say he oversaw 
10 hospitals in that role. And one, the one I mentioned was Sunrise Children's Hospital. This Hospital Corporation of America, the largest hospital. I know what HC is. <laughs> Mr. Hunter, I, what I'm hearing is, from a factual standpoint, he may qualify even under your definition. That's about the best I can give you right now, given that I wasn't given time to prepare for this. Mr. Altenberg? Yeah, if, if I may, beyond his qualifications, I'm, I'm going to be instructing my trial guys to object a lot because of the scope of the pleadings. There, there is no mis risk management claim under 766.166 expressly in count eight. Nothing in there alleged a management thing. It was diagnosis and having a treatment plan is what's in count eight. In count 14, the smorgasbord is now down to a negligent training claim only. And it only references 766.166 in paragraph, I believe it's 170, to say it's sort of like this. And so I was listening to, to opinions that might have been appropriate when count 11 was in, but count 11 was voluntarily dismissed. So anything about the training or, or, the, or the, not the training, but the, the background on Miss Beatty and whether she was disciplined in the past is not relevant to this. Your Honor, as you're aware, we Excuse have... Excuse me. Yeah, let, let Mr. Altenburn finish, uh, please. I thought he was done. At, 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 at any rate, we need to keep this within the scope of the pleadings. And it sounded from what I heard, numerous things were going beyond anything that is left at count 14. And there's no risk management claim pled in count 8, except by incorporating that which is in count 14. Are you done? Yes. All right, sec. Hold on a second. So, Mr. Uh, Whitney, you're telling me that. Dr. Corcoran, when he was an administrator with HCA, had under his constellation of hospitals a pediatric hospital? Yes, Your Honor. And a CMO of Granite Regional Pediatric Hospital within it. Okay. Now, how about Mr. Altenburn's point about the scope of the pleadings. Sure. The scope of the pleadings also include punitive damages claims. And our 76872. On battery and false imprisonment. Correct. And we have to show and demonstrate the ratification or active participation or condoning of these actions by management. And he can speak to all of this because of the violations of internal policies, the failure to train Catherine Beattie, which is what, in her anger management issues, allowing her to continue over this child, leading inevitably to the battery and false imprisonments, all the other misdeeds that she committed against Mike Kowalski, as she's testified to here. So management and risk management are materially relevant to our case here. The issue of risk management not only is subject to our pleadings, but has been up to the second DCA as the court's well aware. So the, the Nexus between risk management and mismanagement of this hospital has all been part of this case for now two years. Hold on a second, please. Reference is being made to Ms. Beatty's prior arrest. No, no, it was not. No, it's, That's it's out. Not in the hospital. No. And I think I struck that last night as well. I, I, I all the questions. You did, you did, Your Honor. I thought I saw it referenced in some of his testimony or affidavit. That's that that could be. I'm, I'm that could be. I miss what are you arguing? Your Honor, additionally, on the pleadings, 
outside of the punitive damages argument. Count 8, which is the medical malpractice count, incorporated count 14, which is the negligent training, supervision, and ratification of the physicians. No, training, not negligent training. And in the lead up to trial, there was an agreement between Mr. Altenburn and Mr. Elegant, I believe, he'll confirm, to collapse count 14 into count 8 to avoid another jury instruction on this issue. There was an offer, and there was never an acceptance because they never gave me jury instructions that could fit there. There's just, there's no agreement on that. Then in that case, count 14 is still an active count, so. For negligent training only under a common law theory backed up by 766.166 and a reference to a bill of rights, which is a piece of material only admissible to establish a common law standard of care. There is a statutory bill of rights provision in the Florida statutes. It has no private right of action. It has a different penalty. Well, we've consumed all this time. The bottom line is I guess he's testifying, and there's going to be lots of objections, and I'll just have to do the best I can with the rulings on the fly. Are there any other motions that are going to be very substantive like this that I need to know about so I can be ready for them? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Thank you. From the plaintiffs, there will be. Well, let's get them quickly because. We will. I guess we didn't get any exhibits, so. Do you want to handle one or two, or do you just want to leave it up to Your Honor? Are they needed for this witness? A couple of them. If they're needed for this witness, then let's do them. What do you need? Well, I say that. Mr. Whitney, which one or ones are we talking about? Just a moment, Your Honor, just if we could. I'm sorry? If we could just have a moment to decide which one Mr. Anderson would like for this witness. We don't want to argue with things that are either already in evidence or we don't need from this witness. All right, we'd like to address Exhibit 2277, pages 245 and 246. Your Honor, we recognize that there would need to be redactions. I would focus the court on paragraph number three in Ms. Salisbury's email regarding billing. Judge, this is the DCF attorney writing an attorney to the hospital regarding DCF matters and things that she's concerned about. I think it's the Kowalski's attorney. Yes, I'm sorry. The Kowalski's attorney writing the hospital in the DCF hearing. How are you intending on using this? Notice, Judge. Notice on what? We brought to their attention, if I could. Yeah, I got it. I have reviewed records indicating the child is being treated for, quote, complex regional pain syndrome. I guess this is the code. And it gives the code. Medical confirmed would like verifications. Further, I would like an explanation of what medical confirmed means. The purpose of this is to bring, is to demonstrate that it was brought to the attention of the hospital during the course of this on November 11th. And it starts out a printout of the child's diagnosis. My recollection is the hospital agrees it was billing under 
the CRPS. I don't think that's an issue in the case. No, it's not an issue in the case anymore, but the timing of it is when they were notified of it and whether they continued to do it. Okay. What does that have to do with anything? Well, I think it would go to our fraud count regarding the billing as to whether there would be uh, the required clear and convincing standard on it that they it was brought to their attention. They knew what the problem was. They chose midway through her stay to continue to bill for sure. I mean, you, it's to one of the lawyers here. The way we were hoping to fix that was simply to uh, delete names and just make it to uh, the, 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 the defendant. The unfair prejudice of this exhibit outweighs any probative value, even if I were to figure out a way to splice it to only get to that small paragraph. So I understand the court that's going. out. That's exactly the point, Judge. It, it, it's, it's undated notes that somebody's going to have to interpret. Nobody's going to testify as to who wrote the notes, what they mean. If somebody picked up my notes from today, they would have to interpret them and try to figure out what the heck they meant. Before we start, we've been here for 40 minutes, or we, anyone want to take a break, or you want to get going? Um, this will, uh, I, I think we have time for a break if the court would like one, simply because we've got. This I'm fine, I'm just want. asking the lawyers if you want one. <laughs> the defense would like a five minute break, Your Honor. Let's take a five minute break then.
Please be seated, everybody. Okay, before we bring the jury in, what witnesses are we going to have tomorrow? Plaintiffs. Uh, depending on the length of this testimony, we may have to push our next witness in tomorrow, which would be Jessica uh, Blackrick. Um, we also have uh, Deborah Salisbury and Brian Gillis. Um, they testify tomorrow. Uh, we have uh, a rather long deposition, relatively, of Dr. Eli Newberger and deposition excerpts of Dr. Sally Smith. And if we can get to it, the Kowalskis will begin their damages testimony. Um, if I may inquire, uh, I can't foresee what uh, Ms. Salisbury or the other attorney, I've forgotten his name, could possibly testify to in this action that's not going to invade what went on at DCF. So if we could get a proffer from the police so I know what to prepare for. Uh, especially with Ms. Salisbury. So what's Ms. Salisbury going to testify to? Uh, I wish I had my notes in front of me. I know she's been instructed not to get into anything involving the DCF matter, but she was involved in sending warnings to the hospital about certain behaviors. And so, again, it goes to the notice to the hospital that Kathy Beatty was acting out as against Mike Kowalski. I wish I had my notes here. And she can also speak to the, the factual... Scenario of the Morris transfer that we've heard a lot about. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry. Well, the, the first area of inquiry, I would think, would be entirely both duplicative and potentially privileged. If she's going to come in and say, as the attorney for one of the Kowalskis, I was sending warnings. No, well, it's not your privilege to yeah, be I, concerned about. It, sorry, go ahead, Mr. Warren. It's not only that, Judge. The, these matters were squarely in front of Judge Hayward in the dependency action. She was dealing with Judge Hayward in the dependency action. And the matters that are being alluded to were brought, brought to Judge Hayward's attention in that dependency action and dealt with at that time. So it, this is a matter, once again, of us going into to matters that were before the dependency court that are not only duplicative of, of what we've heard already, but also were before Judge Hayworth and subject to his jurisdiction at the time. Well, obviously, if it's talking about the dependency court, I'll shut it down, just like I've been yes. on everything else. Uh, you know, we have big red lettered things. Don't ask this. Don't get into this on our desk. But, I mean, if, if there's a, a notice that's separate and apart from what was transpiring within the dependency court, perhaps that is relevant, maybe it's cumulative, maybe not. I don't, until I hear it, I, I won't know. And who is the other gentleman that they're having coming in for? Brian Gillis. He would be was similar. Was he the attorney for DCF? He was an attorney for DCF at the time. And what what is he going to be testifying to? Again, judge off the top of my head, you remember Mr. Gillis. One issue testimony. would be the issue that arose with Catherine Beatty's email that we tried to have admitted and the Factual assertion that there was a delegation. The email you sustained? Yes, sustained it with, yes, with the additional instruction that the defense could try to prove up a delegation. Yeah. I think it's also important to note that I do not believe Mr. Gillis was actually working on the Kowalski dependency case, and he is currently Deborah Salisbury's practice partner. Was he the DCF attorney at the time? I would, I would defer to Mr. Whitney on that. My understanding was he may have worked for DCF, but he was not staffing the Kowalski case. This is the point, Judge. Yeah, we don't, all right, we have no information to suggest that he has any involvement in this case, except to the extent that he used to work for DCF back then, but had no knowledge or involvement in this case. So, when he was when he when he's been injecting the case before, it's been offering opinions about what DCF should have done or what should have been done in this situation, like a de facto expert of some sort, but yet he's never been listed as such, and he has no personal knowledge of events here that we're aware of. Are we calling him for the dependency action? Because you know that's not happening. I know that that, that is not happening. So. 
What is he being, what is he being called to say? Without my notes, I can't tell you specifically, but I will reevaluate whether we can call him and take any risk with it. Honestly, Judge, I've been concentrating, trying to get ready for this witness and get things going and dealing with their motion. Have we turned over the exhibits that we're going to use tomorrow? Y yes, Kelly Perry takes care of that. Uh, can we check and ensure Kelly Perry is? Yes, they were sent at 12 one. Anything else, Mr. Hunter? Well, it, well the two other matters. One is, I, I really would like to hear some explication of what we're doing with Mr. Gillis, because otherwise, we're floundering around all night trying to figure out what this right. guy's going to say with no indication of what, what he, in fact, is going to be proffered for and, and just wasting a lot of time. And then the second thing is, did I hear Jessica Stevens on the list for tomorrow? Jessica Blackwood. Jessica Blackwood. She is with the Guardian Lighting Program, but we don't know what she's being proffered for. And if it's a Williams Rule situation, we're going to have. It's not Williams Rule. <laughs> it's not Williams Rule. Okay. So for those two witnesses, why don't we have a discussion after the jury leaves before the lawyers leave? So we know this way somebody, if, if your law partner can scan your notes and, and send them to you. And that yes. way we can have a more intelligent discussion before everyone leaves here today so we can be more targeted and focused tomorrow. I understand. Oh, one other thing for the record, Judge. When we when I said withdraw to uh, 453, uh, that is was the, the last exhibit that we were discussing there. I think it was a 277... <coughs> Uh, 453. That was just as words all over the place. Say again. It's the one words all over the place. Yes, we weren't withdrawing that completely forever. We were simply withdrawing it for the purposes of this witness. Okay. Judge, I'm, 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 I apologize for this request, but I've looked at their redacted exhibit and I didn't take the best of notes. And can I ask the no, court to look it. at it to yes, make please. sure that it's in conformance with the court's ruling? Um, the, the top two are, are, are fine. The bottom one, and, and just so the transcript's clear, I'm looking at 2277-630A and 631A. The bottom one looks like I, what I said this morning, but without being able to compare it to the one I actually ruled on. But it, it looks... What... I'm going to publish the other one. I, I, I'm, I mean, if you could pull up the other one, but I think so I can see the underlying, but I think this is this is what I said. Would you like to see 628629 or the other ones? If I can see the, the original without the A, the, the 628 without the A. Got it. Just a moment. But Ms. Crows, this does look. I wasn't suggesting it wasn't, Judge. I just wasn't clear and uh, didn't want it going in. Just a moment. This conforms with what I wrote earlier today. All right. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Anything else, or can we bring the jury in?
I'd like to proceed. Let's bring in the jury. Yes, Welcome, members of the jury. Please be seated. Did you have a good lunch? Yes. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? And I want to confirm while you're away, you reviewed a whole bunch of media about this case. No, nope, great. Has anyone approached you about this case since you were last with us? No. Mr. Anderson, your next witness, please. May it please the court, I'd like to call Dr. Joseph Corcoran. You stand here. Face the clerk and raise your hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give over the truth, the whole truth, and nothing else? I do. Please state your name for the record. Yes, sir. I'm Joseph Corcoran. MD. DO. DO. Uh, and where do you live? I live in Tampa, Florida. And have I asked you here as an expert in hospital administration to advise the jury on your review of the policies and procedures at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital during the relevant period? Yes, you have. I'd like you to give the jury the background, a little uh, bit of your background training and experience for offering opinions here today, particularly your, your, your uh, well, why don't I let you start? <laughs> Good afternoon. So I'm Joe Corcoran. I am an OBGYN by background. Um, after finishing my residency in Philadelphia, I practiced in Sarasota for um, about 12 plus years from 1991 to 2003. Um, I am board certified by the American College of OBGYN. Um, I spent my first three plus years working for a large practice. Uh, in March of 1995, I started my own practice uh, with the idea of keeping it small and boutique-y. Uh, that didn't last very long, uh, and the practice actually grew fairly quickly. Um, and by the end of 2000, by the end of my term with the with the practice. I believe that we had three physicians, three nurse midwives, and four nurse practitioners uh, serving a variety of offices, one of which was here in Venice. Uh, the main one was in Sarasota near Doctors Hospital. Um, uh, in 2003, shortly after I became a dad, um, I had what should have been routine back surgery. There were complications after the back surgery that ended my clinical career. I was unable to continue to stand, bend, lift, twist. Um, obstetrics is a fairly physically demanding specialty, um, even though the babies are fairly small. Um, uh, so it took about two years for me to get better, um, and I did that recuperation at home in Sarasota. In 2006 or seven, I started a business uh, education uh, master's program at University of Florida. Uh, in the Warrington College of Business. I graduated with a Master's of Science in Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Uh, shortly after graduation, I was recruited to a healthcare think tank in Washington, D.C., known as the Advisory Board. Uh, it's been around since the early 70s uh, and is now part of Optum Healthcare. 
Um, <coughs> I joined in November of 2008. My first day on the job was the day before we elected Barack Obama as president. Uh, so it was really kind of neat to have a front row seat to the development of the Affordable Care Act. I had nothing to do with the legislation. We actually helped um, hospitals and large medical groups know how to change in this new paradigm. Um, I was with the advisory board and, uh, through the beginning of 2013. Uh, at the end of 2012, just prior to the election between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, I was asked to deliver a, uh, an address at the Longboat Key Club in Sarasota um, and talking about what would a second term of Obama versus a first term of Romney look like for health care. There were some executives from HCA in the audience. A conversation started that evening um, that ultimately led to them offering me the opportunity to work with HCA Healthcare. HCA Healthcare is a for-profit hospital company. Um, it is currently has about 180 hospitals, I believe, in 20 or 22 states. Um, and uh, so I was offered the opportunity to uh, um, become the chief medical officer of Brandon Regional Hospital um, in suburban Tampa. It's about a 350 to 400 bed hospital at the time. Um, I was in that role from 2013 until 2018. Did Brandon, I'm sorry to interrupt, did Brandon yes, have uh, pediatrics as well? Brandon always had a pediatric capability um, but during my tenure, we actually developed what uh, we referred to as a hospital within the hospital mm -hmm. uh, so that we had a dedicated pediatric emergency department that had a separate entrance from the adult uh, emergency department. Um, and we had a dedicated floor for pediatric patients, including a pediatric ICU. And of course, being a, a, a heavy OB hospital, we always had a neonatal unit as well for newborns. Please continue from there. Thank you. So in the fourth quarter of 2018, uh, based on some progress that I had a hand in at Brandon Regional, I was given the opportunity to uh, assume a larger role within the company. Um, and for better or for worse, that included a move out west. I became the division chief medical officer for the far west division, which um, has responsibility for about 35 cares of site total. but five acute care hospitals in the state of California, three acute care hospitals in, um, in Las Vegas, Nevada, including Sunrise Hospital, which is about 800 beds today. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Sunrise Children's Hospital, which again has a separate entrance and a separate emergency department, uh, accounts for 206 of those beds. Um, I was in that role for about three years, including um, when the nation learned about COVID, one of our hospitals in the Silicon Valley actually had patient number two in the whole country. Uh, so we were kind of winging it. We were figuring it out. Um, and a lot of what we did um, in managing the, the early cases in California and some in Nevada actually set the foundation for how the rest of the company managed COVID across the, as, it, as it spread from the West Coast. Um, I was in that role for about three years. Uh, I left the role because, quite simply, it came down to a job that I loved and a family that I adored. My wife and my two kids were never able to move out West, so I was commuting um, two, about 2,000 miles, five hours uh, by air. Um, and uh, my, kids, my kids are my world, so that became unsustainable. So at the end of 2021, um, I moved back east. And in the early part of 2022, I accepted an opportunity to um, step away from full-time service to HCA Healthcare and take on the opportunity to serve interim roles. So uh, they would drop me in basically as a consultant, and I would work you know, three months at a time engaged at a specific hospital trying to address more specific problems. 
so did Sunrise Hospital, uh, can you elaborate a little more on what your job duties were there uh, at HCA in the Western Division? And particularly, Jerry would like to know about uh, Sunrise Hospital and the other pediatric units that you were involved in. Yeah, so Sunrise Hospital is uh, a very large safety net hospital. As, as I said, it's over 800 beds today. Um, the night of the 1 October shooting, you may remember where there was a sniper at the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Um, the night of that shooting, um, 100 patients were taken to the county hospital, the old Clark, Ge Clark County General, which ultimately became University Medical Center. They accepted 100 trauma patients and then shut off and went on divert. Our hospital emergency room took over 350 patients in that night. Um, we, we always felt that we had to be there for the community. Um, so it was very much a safety net hospital. It was, um, you know, really kind of, to, it was off the strip. It was not the glamorous part of Las Vegas. Uh, the children's hospital, and, and, and um, Mr. Anderson, I want to make it clear, as the division chief medical officer, I had a facility chief medical officer at Sunrise okay. who really was um, more responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. Um, did he report to you or she? He, uh, he did. He yes, did sir. report yes, sir. to you? Yes, sir. All right. So you, over, you were over the administrator there in terms of problem-solving and operational decisions? So my focus was always on clinical quality and patient safety. That really is job one for a chief medical officer. So I, I want to make clear, I was not over the, the entire leadership. There was a CEO who, who really ran responsibility for the hospital. My job was to support, lead, direct um, the chief medical officer at the facility, who also had the responsibility for clinical care and quality. Uh Safety, I'm and, sorry. And uh, you said you're uh, married. How long have you uh, lived in Sarasota, uh, setting aside your trip out west? <laughs> so I um, uh, moved to Sarasota in the summer of 1991 after finishing my residency. Um, uh, I was a little bit of a slow learner. I didn't get to meet my wife until 1998, so I was single for a long time. Um, and I lived on Siesta Key for most of that time. Uh, I met Patty in 1998. We got engaged in 1999. We got married in 2000. So we've been married a, a little bit over 23 years now. And is she, uh, is she involved in business as well? Uh, yes, sir, she is. Um, when I met her, she was uh, helping her mom and dad run El Greco Cafe, which was a Greek restaurant down on Main Street in Orange in downtown Sarasota. Um, and it's funny, I actually remember sitting at the intersection uh, waiting for the light to change and saw the logo that said, uh, you know, where, where it was Greek cuisine, where Athens meets Sarasota. And I thought I wouldn't even know what to order if I ever walked in. <laughs> uh, little did I know that I would end up uh, marrying Patty uh, uh, just a couple years later. She now uh, uh, works with her sister and uh, our nephew, uh, and they have started a new chain uh, of restaurants uh, called The Breakfast Company. There's one in the landings. Uh, there's one on State Road 70. And um, soft grand opening was yesterday for the new site across from UTC Mall. So uh, how did you, uh, lack of a better term, get this gig? How, how did I find <laughs> you uh, to advise the jury on these issues? So um, one of my longtime friends is Steve Heese. Um, Steve is uh, someone that I met during the Reagan administration when I was doing my residency in Philadelphia. Um, Steve is a very smart businessman. Um, he ultimately went on to be one of the owners of Chris Craft Boats. This is, this is irrelevant as invoking third parties who were not parties to this. I'm not going to do it. I'll, I'll, I'll speed it, it up, Your Honor. You knew Steve Heese and... I knew Steve Heese. We had dinner. Our wives are friends, so the four of us were having dinner. Um, Steve actually knew Greg as his chief counsel, I believe, for um, Chris Craft Boats. Same objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Uh, that's, that's all I had on that, actually. 
Uh, so, I'm not why completed. You, why don't you let him finish? Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Um, fit, fit, finish the credentials. Portion. Okay. All right. So, in terms of operating hospitals and in advising the jury on your opinions here today, tell the jury about your practical experience in evaluating the operations of hospitals and noting where there are issues that must be resolved. So it started my my involvement in how in assessing and helping hospitals run smarter actually began when I was in practice. I was on the medical executive committee of Doctors Hospital in Sarasota for four years. I was elected as the chief of staff, but my surgical complications did not allow me to fulfill that role. Um, after graduation from business school, as I said, I was recruited to the advisory board, which was a think tank and a consultancy. So my roles involved going to health systems, hospitals, and large medical groups, giving them business insights about how to work in this new Affordable Care Act paradigm primarily. And then for HCA, as I said, I was a chief medical officer at Brandon, which was about a 375-bed hospital, which has subsequently grown, and then had responsibility for about 3,500 beds all total between California and Nevada in my role as division chief. And, uh, how, and can you explain how uh, HR, if you will, played a role, uh, whether you were either directly involved or over and making decisions uh, in terms of the HR departments in these different hospitals? So I didn't have any direct responsibility for the HR department, but I did have uh, leadership responsibility or executive accountability for the medical staff office, and that was a responsibility that I shared with my CEO. I had res direct responsibility for the quality department, and I had a VP, a vice president of quality who headed up that department and had maybe half a dozen to a dozen uh, members on her team. I also oversaw a couple of other the or organizations, including um, computer physician order entry. Were you involved uh, in uh, your, some of your roles <coughs> in the development of hospital policy uh, on various topics? Yes, sir. Um, so I didn't write the policy, but we met with the folks who did. Um, that typically was somebody with a with a legal degree, um, so that we made sure that we wrote it the right way. Um, but yes, I was involved in those conversations as they applied to clinical quality and patient safety primarily. And some of the different policies and procedures that we will discuss here today, have you been directly involved or overseen the direct involvement in the development and management of those policies? Well, not the policies that we'll look at today, but policies like that as they applied to they obviously not our these, hospitals. But, yes, sir. But in other hospitals. Yes, sir. And then uh, in terms of your As chief medical officer in Brandon Regional Hospital, then, can you explain your role in terms of overseeing or developing and or developing hospital policy and procedures of the type that we'll be discussing here today? Yes, sir. So, for instance, one of the things that we did, uh, aside from just writing policy, was actually uh, working on performance improvement. So, for instance, um, shortly after I started at the hospital in the, in the early part of 2013, uh, we participated in an effort to improve how we were doing with uh, sepsis, uh, which is an overwhelming bacterial infection. When I joined the hospital, if you were diagnosed with septic shock, there was a 44% chance that you would die rather than be discharged home. That was unacceptable from a clinical perspective. Average nationally is about 30%. In Before the end of the year, we actually worked as a team, and I had a part in leading that team. We worked as a team to put in new procedures based on what evidence and data showed us was the right path. We created guardrails for our clinical teams to, to, to stay between. What's a guardrail? Uh, that's my term for it. Um, we, we said, you know, look, the data and, and evidence says that this is acceptable and this is acceptable, and there's a range, 
right? So I think about it as guardrails, and we leave the which lane to be in. We leave that up to the physician um, based on their knowledge, their skill, their education, their judgment. But we know that if you stay between the guardrails, the data and the evidence points us to the patient is more likely to get the, the favorable outcome that they want and we want for them. So um, we were able to lower our mortality rate from 44% to 24%. And we maintained that performance for several years in the, in the mid to low 20s. And can you uh, explain your involvement with the, the standards that you'll be uh, speaking about today? They're called CMC or CMA? CMS? CMS standards. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, uh, lawyers frequently talk about standards of care, and that's a legal definition about what is expected a physician to do when treating whatever. Sure. And insofar as the CMA standards uh, based on the court's ruling, I want to ensure that we just uh, stay involved with your knowledge of uh, the development of them, any participation you had. Sure. And it's CMS, CMS. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the federal, um, federal organization that oversees Medicare and Medicaid spending. Um, so I had nothing to do with developing the CMS standards, but these really are the, there's a book referred to as, well, titled Con CMS Conditions of Participation. And these are the standards that every hospital is held to yeah, if they want to participate. Know that, yeah, I know. Sustained. Yeah. Uh, we can't go into the operation of them, just your background in terms of uh, actually learning about them, using them, developing them. Understood. Thank you. 
So uh, the CMS standards were what I, as a practicing physician and a physician medical staff leader, was held accountable to. The standards were also what I was held accountable to as a chief medical officer to make sure that my hospital was was meeting those standards. Objection is sustained. I'm sorry. So, and for the purposes of this testimony, let's stay away from the CMS uh, standards and simply go with your background, training, and experience on this. Yes, sir. So, what did you review in connection with offering opinions here today? Um, I was provided with a variety of documents. Um, I've listed out in, in, in this. If you could give paper. the jury uh, an, uh, just an overview of everything that we had, uh, you'd received towards offering opinions here. Uh, will do. It's quite lengthy, but it's multiple de uh, depositions from uh, some of the treating physicians, um, from uh, Kathy, Catherine Beatty, uh, some documents from uh, Johns Hopkins um, variety of organizations, including All Children's Hospital. Um, Uh, some policies and procedures from doctors uh, from uh, All Children's Hospital, um, the medical staff rules and regulations dated February 2016, um, depositions of Dr. Napolitano and Perno, um, uh, Patty Condon, uh, Jackie Crane, uh, organizational structure org charts for. Uh, uh, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, um, reports from various experts. Okay. And what was your assignment here? So you asked me to be a part of this, um, this case. litigation, this case, um, to really help the judge and jury understand how hospitals work. They're very complex. They're very complicated. Um, the hospitals that I worked in, um, uh, Johns Hopkins actually has a, another layer on top of it because it is an academic medical center which has its own kind of fiefdom, right? So I'm, I was really brought on. Object to relevance. Johns Hopkins is not part of the case. Oh, oh, oh. And if you can speak to the, uh, any experiences you had where you were working with or developing things with Johns Hopkins, any one of them. Yeah, so um, I'll be more precise about Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. I apologize. Um, so, um, so I'm sorry, the question was, sir? Well, uh, that's a good point. Uh, I, I added on to it about any experiences you had actually working with Johns Hopkins and uh, developing any policies, procedures, or other programs? So I never worked directly with Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. When I was at Brandon Regional Hospital as the chief medical officer, as I said, we opened a pediatric hospital within the hospital. We actually worked with Jackie Crane, Dr. Napolitano, and other leaders from All Children's to help us build that hospital within the hospital. For the pediatric aspect of it? Yeah, yes, sir. It was a pediatric hospital within the hospital. Okay. Now, um, so that the uh, jury understands here, in terms of uh, the hierarchies in hospitals, and can we bring up um, uh, the, I guess it's now 2802 uh, organizational chart, published, Judge, if we may. 
Is it evidence? Yeah, it's the 2015 oh. version we talked about. I'm sorry, Judge, I want to go to our witness. Can you please tell the witness? Okay, are you finished with your credential background? Yes. Then Mr. Hunter can go out of here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, just a few questions at this point. Uh, as I understand it, uh, your first billet, if you will, as a hospital executive, was at Brandon Regional Hospital? Yes, sir. My first hospital-based leadership yes. position, yes, sir. And before that and to the present day, you had not practiced in a children's hospital outside of medical school, correct? As an obstetrician gynecologist, yes, I have not practiced medicine at a children's hospital, and I okay. apologize for not being more clear before. That, that's not a problem. And you haven't worked in a children's hospital since but, medical school. That's not entirely true because, again, Brandon Regional had the children's hospital within the, within the bigger hospital, and Sunrise Sunrise Hospital has Sunrise Children's Hospital. Okay, well, let, let's compare and contrast for a Okay. Moment. Brandon Regional Hospital is a general hospital, correct? That is correct. Is, is it licensed as such by the state of Florida? Sir, I didn't, I'm not aware of the license. You don't have any idea what the licensure classifications that's, are? That's outside my wheelhouse as a Would CMO. you have any reason to um, doubt that it is licensed as a class one general community hospital? That's outside of my wheelhouse. I wouldn't even be able to comment on it. Do you have any idea? I, no idea. Okay. We can agree that it takes adult patients. It does. That's primarily what it does, correct? It does. And it does adult surgery? It does. And the hospital within the hospital is just one floor of a general hospital, Correct. When I was there, it was limited to one floor, yes, okay. sir. And that wasn't there when you started. It was something you all developed. That's correct. Okay. It has nearly 400 beds. Correct. It's in a community as a community hospital, correct? Yes, sir. Doesn't, does, doesn't have a reputation for referrals far outside to, as a tertiary care institution? Actually, it does a lot of intake for some of the um, specialty work that it does, particularly in neurosurgery and other uh, other services that aren't maintained at most community hospitals. Okay. And they're adult services? Um, yes, sir, but we also took in transfers from, um, from of newborns. Okay. So if you had problems with a newborn, you transferred it, correct? Well, we kept most of them at the hospital. But you, if you had a complicated newborn, you transferred it to a children's hospital, correct? For the most part, yes, sir. Okay. Now, do you have any idea what the number of beds at all children's has? I believe it's in the neighborhood of 200, 240, 250. What is their licensure, do you know? I have no idea, sir. Do you know what the acuity level of the beds at all children's are? I do not. Do you know how many NICU beds they have? I do not. Do you, have, do you have any idea how many PICU beds they've got? I do not. To talk about your hospital in Las Vegas, you never worked in that hospital, did you? I was in the hospital on a weekly basis, but I never had an office in that okay. hospital. You didn't have day-to-day -day responsibilities for being the CMO of that hospital, correct? That is correct. I was that CMO's boss. Okay. And you were over the top of him and didn't have command of the executive team, did you? Not command, no, sir. Okay. So you were not directly responsible for operations in that hospital. You were supervising what your employee did in that hospital, correct? I was accountable to the work that was done there, okay. but not responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. Okay, that's my point. Okay. So do you, how many beds was that hospital? The hospital writ large is, I believe, just over 800 beds, and I believe just over 200. I believe it's 206 of those are part of Sunrise Children's Hospital. Is it, which, is it separate? The hospital is a multi-block complex. 
Sunrise Children's has an entrance on the south side of the complex. The adult hospital has its entrance on the northwest corner. Uh, the emergency room is uh, both the adult and children's emergency rooms are on the east side. So I don't know how to answer that. They are, you know, when you're leaving one hospital and entering the other, but there there are contiguous hallways. Are they separately licensed? To my knowledge, they are. And how are they? How are the license class, licenses classified? Do you know? Again, that's a, that's above my pay grade. Okay. What is the acuity level of the bed to the children's hospital? So the children's hospital actually has every conceivable uh, um, level of service, not level of service, every conceivable clinical service, including open heart. They have a very active open heart program. They have neurosurgical, pediatric open heart, pediatric neurosurgical. Um, Sunrise Children's is the tertiary care hospital for the state of Nevada. Okay. And your responsibility was overseeing the CMO of that hospital? My responsibility, my accountability to my bosses in Nashville was to make sure that that hospital was running. I relied on my chief medical officer as my right hand for making sure that that happened. But at the end of the day, if something went afoul, I had to answer to it. And when were you working with those folks? Uh, began in the fourth quarter of 2018, okay. and I finished in the fourth quarter of 2021 for three okay. years. So those three years, but during the time this incident took place, you were at Brandon Hospital, correct? That's correct. And at the time this incident took place, you had not worked in a pediatric hospital in 30 years, correct? Again, that goes back to my clinical career. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But might have, may, might not be 30, but more than 15. Going back to medical school? And, re and residency training, so up to 1991. It's pretty close. We're getting old, aren't we? All right. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, if we could bring up... I think what I was doing here is having... Okay. This isn't confusing at all, is it? <laughs> uh, uh, let me represent to you, and for the record, this is uh, John's Office All Children's Hospital. Uh, well, actually, that's identified by exhibit. Where is it? We've got to get set up here again, Judge. All right, so this is uh, exhibit Johns Hopkins, uh, actually 2802, the Johns Hopkins organizational chart as of 2015, uh, the year before uh, what we're talking about here. Now, um, I'm sorry, the date on mine says February of 2016. That is, are you looking at the fine, same? I think. I think it was 2015 issued and 2016 on it. No, we said 2016. It was revised 2022, 2616. All right, so it's 2016. Okay. Okay, can you take the jury? You know what I mean? We approach. I'm sorry. We have an issue with this
Uh, we're just trying to keep all our uh, paper in a row here, so sorry about that. But I think we've figured it all out. I'll keep asking questions. All right, so before we get to the organizational chart, can you tell the jury a little bit of the history of John, how John All Children's Hospital became a Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, to the best of your knowledge? Yes, sir. Foundation, Your Honor. Sustained. Uh, are you aware of the circumstances surrounding the acquisition of the date and the general terms of how Johns Hopkins All, how All Children's Hospital became Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital?
You may continue, Mr. Anderson. Yes, Mr. Anderson, it is. Can you tell the jury approximately when All Children's Hospital became Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? On April 1st, 2011. And is Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital part of the Johns Hospital Hopkins Hospital system? If you know. Um, I believe that Ms. Crane described it as the sole corporate member, JHHS. Right. And they do a, did appear on the 2012 org chart. I've not seen the 2016 version. So then let's bring up the 2016 org chart if we have it now. Yes. All right. Oh, this is just so much less complicated. <laughs> uh, now, can you, uh, you know, the first thing I, we'd like to know is, your position at uh, when you were working for Hospital uh, Corporation of America, uh, where would you fit in in this? Was there a similar position? Well, I I don't see a specific box that identifies Chief Medical Officer mm -hmm. on the um, on this All Children's Hospital chart one. Right. Okay. Are there any equivalent positions there? Just to orient the jury. Right, I'm looking. At the time, I believe they had a vice president of medical affairs, um, Dr. Brigitte Mueller, in mm -hmm. 2016. I'm looking for her box on this org chart. Let's, uh, let's go to the next page, please. And what I'm looking for here, and you can uh, drop us when we... What I'm trying to look at here, and there's uh, Dr. Mira. So this position right there? Mm, I see it. Okay. So let's then, if we can scroll through the next page. All right. What I'm trying to establish here is the chain of command from the president down to risk management. There you go. Okay. okay. Now, if you can identify risk management, which I used to be able to on the old chart. Right. So risk management is on the upper right corner. Right, thank you for the red box. Risk management is one of one, two, three, four, five organizations that report directly up to senior counsel, Jackie Crane. Mm -hmm. Jackie Crane then has uh, direct reporting responsibilities signified by a solid line. Yeah. One goes directly to President Chief Executive Officer Jonathan Ellen, MD. One goes to the right to JHHS, which is the Baltimore-based um, organization, and then one goes further to the right to the internal auditor. All right. So in terms of the level, I see that uh, the risk management department is separated off to report directly up to the senior general counsel. Director Lee, your honor. Overall, you can answer. Yes, that is correct. Risk management was responsible for reporting up to the senior counsel, Jackie Crane. I just want to point out our expectation as leaders is that you not only expected your reports to direct. Your Honor, it's not responsible to request All right. Thank you. What, if anything, is different about this that you're about to explain? 
I was just going to explain that there's a push of information up to your boss, rule of thumb, never let your boss be surprised. But there's also a responsibility to pull information up because you are, you are accountable as a leader to the organizations that you lead. You can delegate out tasks. You can delegate out. Your Honor, it's unresponsive to a question, but you have a total comment that has no foundation. It, we'll rule the foundation, but let's have a question next time. Well, why is the pull part of this so important? So as a leader, you are responsible for what your teams are doing. So um, they should be reporting up to you, but it's your job, if needed, to pull information from them so that you have a clear understanding of how they are, how they are performing on tasks that you have delegated down to them. So for the general counsel, senior counsel right here, and the senior counsel reports, to the president? That's correct. The, the general counsel. Uh, senior counsel. Senior counsel for your uh, background training experience, would that she have a duty, he or she have a duty to pull information then on a timely basis from risk management? Objection, I lack the foundation in this, in this organization, you speculate. Let's just go with uh, non speaking objections, please. Foundation, speculate. Overall. You can, you can yes, sir. In an, in, an, in an organization such as this, you would expect that there would be a push and pull accountability. And would that be on a, uh, a reasonably frequent basis? Or generally, generally, I would meet with my direct reports on at least a weekly basis, if not more frequently. All right. So if you could then... Um, Tell us whether, as to this chart, then <coughs> the risk management was directly reporting and the uh, senior counsel di directly pulling information uh, up to the most senior levels of executives in this operation. Uh, Your Honor, relatives 403, Black Foundation. You can answer. Yes, so the senior counsel should have been getting information from risk management on a recurring basis and sharing the most relevant information up to the president, chief executive officer, and JHHS, and as needed to internal audit. Now, are you generally familiar with the facts of this case, the uh, Kowalski's versus Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? I am. And are you familiar with the facts leading to the uh, time spent by Maya Kowalski at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital from October of 2016 through January of 2017? I am. And what was significant to you in your review of the facts there that uh, would make this case one that uh, the most, the senior counsel would or should have rather had uh, continuous knowledge of? So this case was... Objection, Your Honor. Relevance Foundation outside of Cleveland. I need to hear that question again, please, Matt, uh, Mr. Court Reporter. Okay, John. What was, the, what was the significance to you and your view of the fact that there would make this case one that the most senior counsel would or should have, rather, had continuous knowledge of? What was those last few words? I'm sorry. The witnesses beginning of his answer? He just said, so this case was in the objection. Let me, Mr. Anderson, why don't you ask the question again, because I didn't yes. quite hear what the court reporter said. It was what we call an inartful question. <laughs> what, um, what I'm asking here is based on your knowledge of the facts, can you explain to the jury why this case situation, whatever you want to call it, about the Maya Kowalski situation, was one that should have, if it didn't, reach the level of senior management? Overall, you can answer that one. Thank you. So 
In multiple depositions, including those that were aired this morning, it was clear that risk management was involved in helping to influence or make decisions of regarding or supporting uh, Maya Kowalski's care. Um, the references in the depositions um, suggest that that was a fairly frequent conversation. Um, on page 166 of Kathy, Catherine Beatty's um, deposition, she describes conversations that she had with risk management that describes, quote, this case was different. You can simply just, without uh, okay. reading it in, just reference uh, sure. references. I'm sorry. I'm That's all right. Have you ever testified before? No, as sir. As an expert? No, sir. All right. All right. So, court, please, the witness seem to have been reading from something just a moment ago. He's got the deposition. I'd like to know what else he's got. What do you have there? <laughs> show, it, show it to Mr. Anderson, who can show it to uh, Mr. Hubble. Sure. It's his file. Mr. Anderson, why don't you go get it and show Mr. Hubble. Of course, please. It's a thick notebook that appears to have selected. Well, I'll come pop up here. So, hold on a second. This is what we're going to do. We're going to put the notebook back there, but we'll get it closed. Okay. If you need to refresh your recollection, just let us know. Okay. We'll we can open it up, and then the lawyers will come up and look we'll at whatever you're looking at. Understood. Okay? Thank yes, you. sir. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, can you <laughs> reorient me? Yeah, can we read back the uh, last question? One question was, 
You can simply just without reading it and just reference references. I think the one before that. Okay. What I'm asking here is based on your knowledge of the facts, can you explain to the jury why why this case, this situation, whatever you want to call it, about the Maya Kowalski situation was one that should have, if it didn't reach the level of senior management. And there was an objection. Thank you. Thank you for that. So as I said, risk management seemed to have pretty recurrent um, involvement in the case. Um, that's the risk management department. Um, the case was described by Kathy Beatty uh, in a conversation that she cited in her testimony that as being different and discussing that with risk management and explaining multiple reasons why she felt it was different. And so armed with that information, what should have happened if it, if it actually didn't? So if this was a case that was constantly pinging in risk management, it seems reasonable that that would be shared with the executive who's in charge of risk management. That would be senior counsel Crane. And so I believe we have an email here from, is that one from, Publish at this time, uh, 2277, 628, and 629 Alpha, previously uh, admitted evidence. You may. All right. Now, do you note here who this is from? It's sent from Patricia Condon. Are you aware of her position? It indicates that she's a risk management analyst at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And do you recognize any of the uh, recipients? It is sent to Jackie Crane, who was senior counsel. It was sent to Louise Barnes Kurth, who I believe was the head of risk management at that time and Cindy Driscoll, which is a name that I do not recognize. All right. Now, if you would review this uh, as to the topic here, you see where they are continuing the allegations of, quote, self-inflicted wounds, scratches. And then and if we can keep scrolling down and how the... There was, they were asked about lesions from uh, Ms. Kowalski, either directly or through her counsel. We need your honor. What I see is a, is a quote from Ms. Condon. I did advise Dr. Majors to get pictures of the scratches. I need her to inquiry with Maya how she got them. And just reading the exhibit once again, does it appear to you that Dr. Majors, and from this, uh, was advising, or Patty Condon rather, was advising Jackie Crane, among others, about the incident where Maya, what the jury has heard about, where Maya was stripped down, held down, and photographs taken from her? Calls for conclusion, objection, calls for conclusion, relevance. 403. This does reference and a direction advice to get pictures of the scratches. And assume for the purposes of this question that the photographs taken of Maya Kowalski were never analyzed as part of the medical records and a after set were never taken, and that this just appeared to be an unpleasant, highly unpleasant situation 
for Maya Kowalski without any authorization from parents or anyone else. Is this the type of incident that should be reported up to the highest levels? Objection, Your Honor. Assumes facts, not evidence. Can we approach on this entire matter just a moment? Sure, you can approach. You can re-ask the, the question. Thank you. Do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience into a reasonable medical sorry. Do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience into a reasonable medical management probability as to whether the senior level executives at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital were made aware of the situation involving obtaining pictures of Maya Kowalski? Objective foundation and proper hypothetical. Overall, you can answer. From this email, it's apparent that Jackie Crane received this email and the information was there for her to receive. And based upon your uh, background and training and your knowledge, what would be the appropriate thing to do if a senior level person, management level person, received reports that could be construed as a battery upon a child, what should they do? In my experience as a chief medical officer, if I saw information like this from one of my direct reports, I would investigate. I would get involved. I would make sure that I knew. I understood what was going on. Would you get personally involved is what you're saying? Absolutely. Form and and objective, rel objective relevance. So now, um, from your review of the facts of this case, can you tell the jury, and, and strike it, and have you had the opportunity to review various uh, emails and uh, other documents uh, involving the exchange of information between uh, Ms. Condon and Ms. Crane? and others between the Risk Management Committee and the senior level to determine whether there was an appropriate response back down from senior management to investigate this further. I have seen emails where information was shared with Ms. Crane. I've not seen any emails that there was a response directing other actions to be taken. And assuming that these photographs were taken uh, several days later, do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience into a reasonable medical management probability as to whether this failure to investigate caused or contributed to the injury done to Maya Kowalski from the photo session? Objection, speculation, no validation. Yes, sir, I do have an opinion. And what is that opinion? I believe that it did contribute to the injury. Um, and I think that we all, I was here on Monday and I heard that loud and clear from Maya Kowalski herself. And in this instance, uh, strike, I'll move on. I'd like to bring up 
Exhibit 1082, and for the record, that's the Johns Hopkins patient family rights there. And if we could go to the next page that sets forth the actual. And then if we could go down and to, or look at the first two under expect privacy and always receive polite and now, based on your knowledge of what happened to Maya Kowalski just in this incident, do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience as to whether Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital violated its own internal statement of rights to patients? Objection to relevance outside of pleading. Overall. Yes, I do have an opinion. And what is that opinion? I do believe that there were episodes that have been reported um, in testimony that were outside of these directives as rights uh, that patients should have and expect. Same question as before. Based on your background, training, and experience, if a senior member of management learns that patients' stated rights are being violated on a consistent basis, what should they do? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance Foundation outside the pleading. Again, as a leader, if I saw this kind of information coming up from one of my direct reports, yes, I would get personally involved and I would find a way to get us back on track. And would that involve, uh, what if any training would that involve as to the participants? I would certainly make sure that they understood what the patient rights were that we were advertising as affording every single patient in the hospital. I would make sure that they understood what was in bounds and what was out of bounds. And would you, what if anything would you do to ensure that if a particular employee, in this case, let's say, uh, Kathy Beatty rejected that training. What is your opinion based upon your background, training, and experience into a reasonable medical management probability should be the action taken with an employee in this situation who either fails or refuses to accept this training? Objection and relevance foundation outside of pleadings, no foundation. I don't understand the question. So I'm going to sustain it on my own. I don't understand what you just asked. <laughs> All right. Maybe I'll ask another one. All right. So what is appropriate in this circumstance for the retraining of Kathy Beatty if there was a circumstance such as you have learned repeated behavior violating the patient's internal rights? What type of of training should be undertaken in addition to just educating them on this. Objection. I don't understand that one. Same objection as before. I sustain. As to the training? I, I don't understand your question, Mr. Anderson. I'm okay. sorry. I'll, I'll move on, Judge. All right. I would like to direct you over to the farthest uh, column right before the black column right there, and the top is going to arrow next to it, and it involves uh, the ability to talk to another position outside of this. I want you to assume, for the purposes of this question, that one of Maya's, one or more of Maya's treating physicians, in particular Dr. Ashras Hanna, attempted to visit Maya in order to gain an understanding of her physical condition, how she was doing, and that he was rejected not from, from, not from trying to go and treat, but simply as a visitor who was a doctor. Do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience to a reasonable medical management probability as to whether Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital violated this right 
that Maya Kowalski had. Objection to relevance assumes facts, not an evidence improper hypothetical. Sustained. There's been evidence of Dr. Hannah Maya. Sustained. All right, now, um, has it come to your attention through your investigation that uh, the Kowalskis were attempting to exit Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital during the first seven days of uh, Maya post admission. Yes. And has it come to your attention that over that period of time there was no court order um, that authorized keeping her there? Yes. I'd like to show and publish now uh, trial exhibit 2237-005, and this is from the Johns Hopkins Discharge of Patient Against Medical Advice. First, what is AMA? Against Medical Advice. Does it have the power of law? No. All right, so if we look at this chart down here, and we continue down, from your review of it, and, and further down, it, is this describing what the Johns Hopkins personnel should be doing in the event that a parent disagrees with their proposed treatment and wants to just get their child out of there? Petitioner, Your Honor, relevance foundation, like a foundation, like correct. This is the foundation. Can you all approach, please? Objection, uh, witness can answer. Uh, if we go to the bottom of exhibit 2237-005, now leaving out the uh, comment on the lower right, under... I'm the, looking for the document, it's not up. Okay, let's put up 2237-005. I've got it, thanks. Previously. And if you look at this flow chart here, Down below, in all cases, does it appear to you, and based on your knowledge of the power or lack thereof of AMA, that Johns Hopkins breached its own internal rules regarding the ability of the Kowalskis to leave simply on the basis of AMA? Objection, Your Honor, it's leading improper predicate. Relevance. 
Mr. Felbridge. We just discussed that. Uh, we'll, uh, you can answer. Thank you. So I wasn't a party to the conversations, but there is nothing in this policy or this flow chart that should keep Maya's parents from walking out the door. It may be against medical advice, but there's nothing here. And to the extent that they prevented in some form or fashion, either through security or through representation of some kind, the Kowalskis from leaving with Maya, and I'm talking about this period, the first week, do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience into a reasonable medical management probabil probability as to whether they violated this internal rule regarding AMA? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance Foundation uh, assumes facts, not in evidence, and fails to take into account Chapter 39. We object on the basis of the latter. He's limited to the first week, so I'm going to overrule the objection. He limited the question to the first week. I understood, Your Honor, this is the 24 hour rule as well. You can yeah. continue, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, I do have an opinion. And what is that opinion? My opinion is that they did not follow their own internal procedure. And confining it then to just this week, we're talking about before there was any court in, uh, intervention, do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience and your review of the depositions of the Kowalskis and the facts of this case as to whether that action in violating the rules caused or contributed to harm to my Kowalski? Same objection. Yes, I do have an opinion, and I do believe that it contributed to the injury. I'd like to ask you, and I want to focus now, go back to 1082, if we could. I mean, I published just the same patient's rights. You may. All right. Now, if we look... Uh, on the center column, the third from the bottom, where it discusses cultural values and spiritual beliefs. Let me ask you to assume for the purposes of this question that Maya Kowalski was prevented on one or more occasions from practicing her religion, either by not being able to pray with or see her uh, own parish priest or by having uh, certain materials taken from her or not provided to her, I should say, or by uh, having this religion criticized. Do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, experience as to whether Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital violated their internal statement of rights that they'd be allowed to practice their cultural values and spiritual beliefs. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance, like a foundation, uh, the failure to take into account the interplay of DCF in Chapter 39 and uh, outside the police. Overall, do you answer? You may answer. Uh, yes, I do have an opinion, and I do believe that they did not respect the patient rights that you've highlighted here. Did you see anywhere, and strike that, did you have the opportunity to go through, if not all, the majority of the medical file during the time that Maya Kowalski was in Johns Hopkins from all October of 2016 through January of 2017. Did I have the opportunity? Yes. To, did you review it? I did not review much of the medical record because I'm being asked not as a medical expert, but as an expert in how hospitals are meant to run. Then I'm not going to ask the next question. I want 
aren't you to assume for the purposes of this question that the Kowalskis informed the physicians during this first week that they had a different type of medical treatment and did not want to move forward with the hospital's recommendations. Do you have an opinion based upon your background training experience to a reasonable medical management probability as to whether the hospital violated the second from the bottom on the first column to uh, right to refuse treatment? Jackson Lack Foundation relevant, Your Honor. Rolls outside the police. Yes, I do have an opinion, and this right clearly states that you have a right to refuse treatment except that written by law. And have you seen anything in these records or been told in any of your uh, investigation that the Kowalski's decision uh, to be treated, have their daughter treated outside of Johns Hopkins violated any law? I'm sure. sure. I've seen nothing to the sort. Have you become aware that there was an incident where Maya Kowalski was placed into a quote surveillance room and told that it was some form of EKG when in fact she was being surveyed by the hospital? Objection Foundation, misrepresentation of the record. Overall. Um, I understand that it was an EEG, right. electroencephalogram, not an electrocardiogram. And those rooms in pediatric hospitals, it's normal for EEGs to be videotaped. That's not a practice in an adult, in an adult setting. In this instance, did it come to your attention that no actual EEG was ever performed? There was certainly no evidence of that on the videos, that they were performing an EEG. That would involve a lot of wires, and it would be very easy to see. All right. And assume further, for the purposes of this question, that there are no results, analysis, or barely mention of this procedure in the medical records surrounding it. Do you have an opinion based upon your background, training experience, and to a reasonable medical probability as to whether, again, this violated Maya Kowalski's patient's rights to be able to move freely around? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance Foundation 403 is outside the bleeding. No world. You can answer. She was placed in an EEG room and surveilled, but that apparently never made it to the medical records. Correct. Which would indicate to me that it was not part of the care and treatment of Maya Kowalski. And so then, uh, do you have any opinions as to why they were doing this? Objection calls for speculation. No foundation. No rule. Need to testify. I, I, it, it certainly wasn't to treat her and help her feel better um, because it was never documented. Rule of thumb is if it's not documented, it wasn't done. Um, as to whether they were trying to just observe her activities, her actions uh, surreptitiously, uh, that's as likely as any reason for it. Would you expect in that circumstance for there to have been some documentation in the medical records, some discussion of results or observations? Objection, lack of foundation. He's indicated he didn't review the record. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move on. Mr. Anderson. The next seven minutes, let's bring us in for a, a good point for a break. <laughs> yes, sir. I'd like to bring up uh, Exhibit 3002-0002.
And for the record, this is the quote, consent for medical for routine diagnostic procedures and treatment. May I publish, Your Honor? Consent okay. evidence 3002-0002. It's a defensive exhibit. I've never developed a, um, in, a consent to treat. Um, I'm certainly familiar with them as both uh, in my professional life and as a patient. All right, and so in this uh, particular one, then there's a consent to treatment that involves uh, understanding that imaging technology, videotapes, photographs, closed circuit TV, monitoring patient care, may be used. You see that in the course of treatment? During the course of treatment. And why is that phrase, during the course of treatment, significant to any consent that the Kowalskis gave or did not give? Objection to relevance, Sean. Over. So in the deposition this morning that, you, uh, that was shown of Dr. Perno, he said that the consent to no, treat... Objective. You can just you know, have to reference it. Just your opinion. Okay, I apologize. Go ahead. No, sorry. It's been testified that the consent to treat gave the legal consent. Your Does this? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll I'll rephrase. In your practical and clinical experience, is there a requirement that? any such video or photographs have to be part of actual treatment in order for these consents to apply. Objective form, calls for conclusion, relevance, overall. Yes, it's clearly stated that videotapes, photographs, and closed circuit television monitoring of patient care may be used during the course of treatment. And so, if the jury were to determine, want to determine whether this consent had any validity, what would they want to look for in the medical records around the time of any such photos or video? Objection. Foundation speculation. Oh, those two objections. At a very minimum, I would expect that the videos, photographs, etc would be part of the medical record if, in fact, it was part of a course of treatment. And would you expect there to be discussion or analysis of them as to the why, how, and result? Same objection, Your Honor. Uh, overall, you can answer. Yes, I would expect that it would be referenced in a progress note. I would expect that there would be results or interpretations, just like any other test. And so then let me bring up Trial Exhibit 2277-06. I'd like to move in Trial Exhibit 2277-068, part of the risk management file. I mean, why was this one of the ones? 
ones that we discussed. It looks like one of the ones we discussed, but could we approach that? Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we take a break? <laughs> <laughs> Members of the jury, do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do the investigation and receive no information. Let's try to keep it to a 15 minute break, please. All rise. Door is exiting. has testified that he's never reviewed the medical record to comment on what should be in the medical record or what is or isn't in the medical record. So I don't know what this is being offered for right now, but there's no foundation for it. There's no demonstration of who created it, for what purpose, under what circumstances, or for what, uh, what, what, what intended result. Well, let, let me ask you more fundamentally because I know we been discussing this particular issue for two years now. Is the hospital's position that this was a medical procedure? Yeah. Yes, sir. This was part of a diagnostic procedure. We said that from the outset. Okay. So then what's it doing in a risk management file? I mean, this what? is from the risk management file, right? This is from the risk management file. I don't. I can't tell you what this is doing in the risk management file, Judge. I suspect that they were asking if it was okay to proceed with that based on the consent that was in there. But I don't know that, and I don't know what this means. And there is there is evidence of the, of physicians indicating that they wanted to do the EEG uh, video monitoring. And after five years. No one has claimed ownership to this note that happens to be in the risk management file? We think we know. I, I believe it was um, uh, the first lady. Um, no, Condon. I thought it was Mr. Condon. I thought it was Condon. 
it, it, it might either be, well, it could be Patty Connick, it could be Louise Burns Kurth, but who cares? From our point of view, it's a risk management. It's from the risk management file. It states there's an okay from risk management. It identifies people involved in it. And we're putting it in for the purposes of demonstrating exactly what the court just brought up, which is if this is supposed to be a medical procedure, why is risk management bringing in Sally Smith? Why is risk management bringing in uh, uh, Dr. Dees? Why is risk management involved at all if this is a fairly routine treatment or procedure? Let me just make it more fundamental. Obviously, this is a hearsay document, but it is a statement by the hospital. Correct. So there is an exception to it. So there is a basis for it. It clearly is relevant, extremely relevant. So I don't see how I can keep this out, Mr. Andre. What, what other basis are you suggesting that I include this document? It, it's, there's no indication of what the document means, of who created it, or what the intention behind the, the so-called document is. To make, to, 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 I, I would venture to the comment that saying that this page of random notations is a document is stretching the word document a bit far. It, it came from the risk management file, I'll grant that, but the idea that, that it simply reflects someone having called risk management and been, and been and, and, and asked, is this okay, and been told, yeah, that's, that's not, number one, it's not relevant to particularly anything other than the fact that it occurred, and number two, it, it doesn't give this, with, with these random jottings, any kind of probative value or relevance. Well, here's where I'm just not following your argument, because this has been one of the most hotly contested issues in this case, and you're telling me that a document from the risk management file, and this is one of the punitive damage claims, um, talks about the video, no audio, no order, to see if she can walk on her own suspected Munchausen syndrome by proxy. That this is not relevant? I mean, how is that possible, Mr. Hunter? Judge, the doctors were attempting to get, gather clinical information. There is a notation in the chart, patient transferred to room 709 yesterday for monitoring, continues to have pain all over, but reports she was able to get more sleep last night. Her PO intake appears to be slowly improving. The demonstration is from that note that it is part of the medical record, and exactly the narrative that's being promoted is just not correct. We don't have a date on this beyond what, what, one, two, three, four, at least a range of six dates, so we don't know what it was for. Well, the jury's going to get to see this. highly relevant. I, I don't understand why we continue to talk about it. We've talked about it for years. This is highly relevant. And yeah. I, I mean, I, I just, I guess you, yours and my definition of relevance isn't calibrated the same. So I, I just... It, it, Assuming it's relevance, it doesn't speak for itself. So to, to give it to an expert to opine on be, before the person who actually put it in the record and can explain its contents, when, where, and how, and why it was done, I mean, this is just the wrong time to use this document. Now, now that I, I am more akin to that type of argument, Mr. Oltenburn, but it, it seems like this document is pretty clear as to what it means. So I'm going to go ahead and admit 2277-068. Can we take a break? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Your Honor, at least when this witness is concluded, I, I want a special instruction on the fact that violations of internal rules and policies and things like rights and responsibilities is not a violation of the law oh. or actionable, but it can only be used as evidence. I mean, we need okay. a limiting instruction on what's going on here. Absolutely. Well, I suggest you, on the break, get Mr. Elegant on the phone, you and he start talking about this. Okay. Thank you. All rise. Let's go to recess.
discussing the Okay, members of the jury, I just want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves, you did not do any investigation, and you did no inf or, and you received no information. Is that all correct? And has anyone approached you about this case? And have you seen any media coverage about this case? No. And the doctor's taking the stand again? You can... And you understand you're still under us, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Anderson, you may continue. Uh, I'd like to pull up uh, trial exhibit 2277-068. Is that in? Yeah, that's in. That's the one we just got in. 2277-068. All right. Um, now, Dr. Corcoran, I'd like to orient you to a few phrases here. Um, and the center bottom of the page here, there is an inscription that says, okay from risk. And then if you, and we can highlight that. Now, based on your experience and knowledge, and I'll represent to you this came from the risk management file, um, does this appear to be a form of authorization from a risk management department, given the Circumstances. Judge conclusion, lack of foundation, relevance. Overruled. You can answer. I, I, I don't have enough information to make that conclusion, sir. Assume for the purposes of this question that that, in fact, is a risk is referring to a risk <laughs> management department. All right. So if you then look up in the top uh, right hand, it says that to see if she can walk on her own. Do you see that? I do. And then above that, it uh, points and says uh, something to the effect of no video. It, uh, apparently then, in the PICU. Right. Right. And then below that, it says video only, no audio. Correct. Right. And then if you go down here um, in this box on the lower like the date. right, Able to do when no one was there, I believe. And then finally, on the bottom left, it says no order dash and above it videotaping. And I'll represent to you that this is from the risk management department. Now, Based upon your background, training, and experience, does this appear to be an analysis of a medical need or an analysis of a another need to prove something, a diagnosis or whatever? This does not look like a traditional order, which would be electronically submitted in an electronic medical record. This looks like notes taken. You said it's from the risk management department, so it, I would say that these are notes taken of a briefing or a meeting mm -hmm. where it's decided based on this history, based on this need, we, we have the okay from risk to do videotaping without an order. And then in the center of it, it says suspected Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I know you're not a, a psychiatrist or psychologist, but are, are you aware of whether suspect Munchausen syndrome by proxy <coughs> is a diagnosis of a parent or a child? Objection, Your Honor. Foundation, confidence, relevance, the same. What, if anything, do you know about 
about Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Same objection. It's beyond scope. And finally, I'll point out here in the center above, it says Dr. Smith, Sally Smith, do you see that? I do. And Dr. Dees and Dr. Smith, Sally. you see that? I see that. And have you seen in the records where these two doctors were participating in the ordering of this video? Objection to foundation. I ask you if he has. I have not seen that specific order, but I have seen both doctors referenced throughout the stay. Okay. And have you had uh, an opportunity to investigate as part of your uh, the assignment here the role of Dr. Sally Smith in all of this? I, I have. And did it uh, come to your attention that Dr. Smith was the director of child abuse education at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital during the relevant period of time? Objection to relevance foundation. I believe that she was head of that program from 2015 to 2018, if memory serves. And let's pull up uh, Exhibit 2116. And that's in evidence, Your Honor. That's a committee, I believe. Messages. Now, if you take a look there with Dr. Smith, does it appear Dr. Smith and Dr. Paola Dees were messaging back and forth? It does. And so it says, FYI, we were able to move her to a video room last night. She's Staff has been making notes by watching her remotely. Apparently, she's currently sitting in bed with legs crossed and has a laptop or something propped up on her lap. Objection to leading you see that where it's written there? I do see that. Oh. And I'll ask you to assume for the purposes of the question that the videotaping in question occurred October 18th and 19th, 2016. And then below it, it says, we may need to try to monitor what she's doing online. I wouldn't put anything past her mother. I see that. Objection, Your Honor. Reading the document speaks for itself. It's a predicate. So, if this type of communication was brought to your attention in your roles, uh, as a director of, again, medical... Chief medical officer. Chief medical officer, where two doctors were conversing in this manner about a patient and a patient's mother. What, if anything, would be your concern? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation Foundation relevant. Number one. At a minimum... I would ask, I would address their method for discussing, discussing the case and the tone and characterization <coughs> of their discussion. Does this tone and characterization, based upon your, your knowledge and position, both as a physician and uh, as a medical director, does this appear to be a compassionate concern for a little girl? Objection, foundation, relevance, leading, speculation. In a word, no. And should <clears throat> doctors be trying to set up their patients to see if their symptoms are correct or not? Or I'm sorry? Or not? Should doctors, simply, should doctors... He's trying to set up their patients to develop, for lack of a better term, evidence or proof against them for their diagnosis. Objection to relevance, 403. 
Can you, um, Mr. Corcor, can you re ask that one for me? Should, should doctors, simply, should doctors be trying to set up their patients to develop, for lack of a better term, evidence or proof against them for their diagnosis? Sustain that one. I'd like to pull up 2277-630 and 631A. And this is for the record an email between Patty Condon, who I'll ask for, uh, you to assume for the purposes of this question, uh, was one of the risk management personnel. So the transcript's clear. We're looking at 2277-630A, not... A. Yeah. Did I say 8? I, I think you, you missed the A. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. Now, I'll also ask you to assume for the purposes of this question <coughs> that Louise Burns Kurth was the chief, I guess, of the risk management department and I'll ask you further to assume that this involved a transfer or a discussion of a transfer out of the hospital. And finally, I'll ask you to assume that the Kowalskis would like to get the child out of the hospital but refused to do it to a psych patient, inpatient program, any type of psychological or psychiatric program. Now, can you tell the jury whether this type of attitude as expressed here in this email is indicative of a close relationship with the uh, patient and her family to work together for a transfer or whether this was more of a antagonistic relationship? Objection, relevance, leading 403, Assumes facts, not an evidence, and proper hypothetical. Can I have that one again, Mr. Porter? Porter? Yes, just a second. It's also beyond the scope of the pleadings, Jeff. Now, can you tell the jury whether this type of attitude, as expressed here in this email, is indicative of a close relationship with the patient and her family to work together for a transfer, or whether this was more of an antagonistic relationship. What, if anything, does this email tell you about the risk management position on Maya Kowalski being transferred out? Same objection, Your Honor. In addition, back. Um, you asked about a relationship between the patient and the family. I believe you met the yeah, caregiver and the family. Yes, sir. Um, this looks more antagonistic than collaborative. And are you familiar with the problem of a medical narrative starting in a hospital about a patient or situation? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance 403, beyond the scope of the pleadings, and I think it's assuming facts, not an evidence. Sustained. What, if anything, have you experienced in terms of a narrative, that is, a story based on a selection of facts and ignoring other facts to prove a point or make a point through the course of your experience in hospitals? Same objection, Your Honor. In addition, he's used the prior question to suggest an improper question to the, to the witness. Can we scroll down? Please. So, <clears throat> I think I'll live with the last answer. Let's proceed. Now, can we call it? Two 
Publish. It's in evidence. It is. Then yes. If you could review this and see if whether Dr. Sally Smith appears on here. She's not listed on the Standards and Credentials Committee four, four names down. All right. Sure. And did you have the opportunity to speak to the I agree with that. With what? I agree with it. We don't need him to basically read the document. I understand, sir. I just wanted him to identify that she was on that. Now, did you have the opportunity through your investigation to try to determine the role of Sally Smith in the care and treatment of Maya Kowalski? I did. And what did your investigation reveal? Objection of product lack of foundation, Your Honor. You can so Dr. Smith was head of an outside agency, but had an internal. Well, I'm going to sustain the objection. Okay. What, if anything, did it appear to you in reading through this as to Dr. Sally Smith's role at the hospital? Excuse me, I object. I don't know what he's reading through. I don't know what he's being asked. I assume you're talking about the committee list? Yes, her overall role at the hospital based on the I'm what we've already for a second. to publish then 2045-005. Uh, this is a statement. Actually, is this in evidence? Yes. It's in evidence. All right. May we publish, Judge? It's in evidence, yes. All right. I'd like you to review that statement to yourself, please, Doctor. Do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience into a reasonable medical management probability as to whether, based on your review of the facts of this case, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital lived up to or complied with the statement by Dr. Mueller? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance, foundation, lack of predicate in 403. Sustained. What, if anything, did you see in this organization to indicate that there was a defined chain of, well, that there was a defined leadership or lack thereof. Same objection, Your Honor. I'll overrule that objection. You can answer that one. So, it's 
the indications have been consistent that quality assurance and performance improvement was to be organized at a division level. And there, the divisions report up to departments. There appeared to be no system-wide approach to quality assurance and performance improvement. What's the problem with that? Well, for a start... Actually, Your Honor, it's vague. It's calling for a narrative answer. It's calling for a lecture. It's outside the pleadings. It's 403 violations as well. So, first, it's an expectation that I was held to every time that I was at the facility or division and participating in a regulatory survey that we could demonstrate a system-wide approach. Why is the, that better? Well, very good. You get an answer. It sounds great to have everyone responsible for quality and patient safety, but we've all experienced it that when everybody is responsible, nobody ultimately is responsible. So without um, oversight by an, a, a leader like a VP of quality, a VP of medical affairs, a chief medical officer, somebody to make sure that there was a consistency you had wide standards from one division to the next, and that creates gaps where patients can fall through the, the, the net. Um, and this, my experience in reviewing the system that the leaders have addressed and touted is that, um, this was really a system-wide failure that allowed Maya and potentially others to fall through the gaps. Do you have an opinion based upon your background, training, and experience into a reasonable uh, medical management probability as to whether the system uh, that was set up by Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in operation provided sufficient safeguards to protect children in Maya Kowalski's position? Objection, Your Honor. Foundation relevance 403 improper hypothetical. What if any opinions have you formed about the ability of the system you just testified to to protect children who are in a situation such as Maya Kowalski was during October of 2016 to January of 2017? Same objection, Your Honor. If we say the same question, I agree. It's the same. What changes, uh, strike that, how would this system have to be changed, in your opinion, in order to ensure that situations such as a child uh, being allowed to, or, or being photographed without authorization on two occasions, a child having uh, what we discussed before with the not being allowed to see a, her priest, having things taken from her, these type of events from happening. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance 403, leading, it also fails to take into account DCF and Chapter 39 involvement, and it's outside the plea. That's a world. You can answer that one. So the quality assurance and performance improvement function would need to be overhauled so that it was system-wide. And that's actually something that Hopkins is recognized as a leader in. So the expertise should be readily available to the team at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. But that, that, would, that would provide a consistency from division to division from and, and create a safety for patients as they're being handed off from one caregiver to the next. Do you have an opinion based upon your background training experience into a reasonable medical management 
probability as to whether the system in place provided sufficient safeguards for children at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital during the relevant period? I do have an opinion. And what is that opinion? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance outside the pleadings, improper foundation. I don't think you tied it to my loss of sin as sustaining the objection. Same, same question as to the care and treatment of Mike Kowalski. Same, same objection, Judge. The questions compel as well. I'm going to overrule that and answer. I do have an opinion. What is that opinion? I do believe that the system failed Maya Kowalski and her family during her stay, primarily because the architecture was so siloed that there was no, there were gaps in the safety net that let her care fall short. Your witness. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Once again. Yes, sir. Your Honor, if the court please, could I first approach the witness and ask to look at the materials he's reviewed? Sure. Your Honor. Sure. I'll get this back. No worries. Honest. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, indeed. If I understand correctly what you just showed me, and what I will ask the clerk to mark when we get through here, was a complete list of everything you've reviewed about this case. Is that right? It is a list of everything that was provided to me. Yes, sir. Okay. And it was provided to you grouped by issue. Is that correct? By date and by issue. Yes. So, in other words, if they wanted you to look at issues relating to the surveillance video, they sent you documents regarding that, correct? That is correct. And if they wanted you to look at corporate documents, they sent you a group of documents related to that, right? That's how they're grouped, yes, sir. Okay. And if they wanted you to look at examples of Dr. Smith directing care, they sent you a group of documents related to that, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And then if they wanted to have you look at particular documents regarding the surveillance video, they sent you documents related to that, correct? Yes, sir. That's one grouping. Okay. So, do you have any idea how many pages of policies and procedures and documents 
have been produced in this case? Have been produced to me? No, sir. To the in parties. General. I that the hospital has produced. I, I understand the that the plaintiffs there are, have produced. Got any idea? I understand the number is in the tens of thousands. Okay. We can agree, can't we, that you didn't get tens of thousands of documents? No, sir. You didn't come anywhere close. And for the scope that I was evaluating, I didn't okay. need the entire. Well, so that we're clear, we covered this a little bit earlier, and I'm not going to go back into what I asked you before except perhaps by accident, but you're board certified in osteopathic medicine, but you've never held yourself out as a pediatrician, correct? I am board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. I have a grad. I My I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. No worries, sir. You're an osteopathic physician. I am an osteopathic physician. And you're board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. Yes, sir. That's correct. And you've never been trained as a pediatrician. That is correct. And you've never held yourself out as such. That is correct. And as far as your opinion in this case, it presupposes that the diagnosis of CRPS for this young lady was, was correct, doesn't it? No, as I explained to you during my deposition, um, it presupposes that the proper approach should include an evaluation for CRPS. I see. Okay. Did you ever look at any records of this young lady's care from Lurie Children's Hospital? Not from the hospital, no. Did you ever look at any from Tampa General Hospital? No, I did not. Did you ever review any complete medical record in this case? Medical record, no. Okay. And the depositions that you seem to have reviewed in this case, looking at your list, seem to be somewhat limited. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. I think that's fair. Okay. Well, you, you reviewed Sally Smith's and Ms. Beatty's and Dr. Elliott, Ms. Condon, Ms. Crane. That's about it, wasn't it? No, sir. The, uh, Dr. Perno. Okay, Dr. Perno. Dr. Napolitano. Napolitano. There were others. There were others. Did, yes, you ever, did you ever review Dr. Michelle Smith's deposition? I don't recall that name. Okay, well, that's a good thing because she wasn't deposed. Here's what I meant to ask: Did you ever review her progress notes from the from the uh, from the picky? I did not. So you have no idea what efforts were made to transfer this patient during the first week that she was at All Children's. I didn't review the medical record references to transferring the patient. Okay, so you don't have any idea what they contain. I never reviewed the medical record, so I have no insight into what was in the medical record okay. regarding the transfers. Okay. Now, let's go back to what you haven't looked at. Did you ever look at Dr. Hanna's records, ever see his records at all? Not his records, no, sir. You never saw Dr. Kirkpatrick's records? Not their treatment records. Okay. And uh, you've never seen any order in the chart regarding the uh, EEG video or seizure monitoring, have you? Again, I have not reviewed the medical record because that's not the area of expertise that I've been brought to assess. Well, you've expressed some opinions regarding the EEG video. What I'm trying to find out is... Have you looked at the chart to see what's in the chart about that video? I don't think that reviewing the charts are necessary to inform the opinion that I shared a half hour ago. Okay. But you did indicate in that opinion what you thought the chart could, should contain, right? I was asked to review a memo. I shared my opinion or insight about that memo. Uh, were you ever provided any of the court orders regarding this patient? I don't specifically recall seeing the court orders. 
I may have, but I don't recall it right now. Going back to Ms. Beatty, did you ever see her personnel file? No, sir. Did you ever see any of the evaluations that she had, or annual evaluations? Annual evaluations? No, sir. Okay. So you have no knowledge of any of that? Of her annual evaluations? No, sir. Okay. And with Dr. Mueller, the VPMA, you know who she is? I do. Did you ever see her job description? No, sir. You did notice on all the charts here that there was no title called Chief Medical Officer in their lexicon. And I pointed that out. Okay. So you're kind of assuming where the Vice President of Medical Affairs fits in? You don't really know what her... her, her I don't agree with that characterization at all. Well, you don't know what her job description is, do you? Uh, the job description wouldn't be on the organizational chart anyway, but you are correct. You I do, know, I've you never know. seen her job description. Okay. So you know where the line is, not well, about all. It wasn't represented, so I don't know where that line is, and okay. that was my point. You don't know where the line is, and you don't know where she fits in. On that chart, you are correct. Okay. Well, you looked at several charts, didn't you? Well, I looked at organizational charts that were provided that uh, apparently were from 2012, which had the position listed. Um, we talked about, you talked about some, about the consent. Council put up 3002002. Had you ever seen that before? Uh, not before getting involved in this case, no. Okay. Well, there was a question about the uh, use of the of images, video in this case, mm -hmm. in the course of treatment, correct? Correct. Well, diagnosis is part of treatment, isn't it? I would think so. Okay. You'd agree with me about that, right? Sure. Okay. Um, with reference to transferring this patient, were you ever aware of Ms. Kowalski denying that she wanted to take Maya out AMA? Were you ever made aware of that? My understanding is that the objection that she had was based on the diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder. I understand. So you, your understanding was that she didn't want the child transferred because the child carried a, would carry a, a, a psychiatric diagnosis upon discharge. Is that right? I think we heard that, the, that they didn't want to accept that as a transferring diagnosis. Did you ever see any indication that the hospital was asked to reconsider that part of the medical record. Again, sir, I've not reviewed the medical record. Okay. No, well, I, I, my, my question wasn't really restricted to that. My question was, did you ever see any indication that this family heard gee, you're going to discharge our daughter with this diagnosis we want you to change the diagnosis. Did you ever see any documentation of that? Where would that documentation be? Could be any one of a thousand places. I'm asking you whether you ever saw that suggested. Only in testimony. Okay. You heard it in testimony somewhere? I believe we heard that Monday morning. We heard that someone asked to change the diagnosis? No, we heard that the diagnosis was rejected. I understand that. Okay. Listen to my, care, my question very okay. carefully, please. Because it's probably confusing, <laughs> even to me. I confuse very easily. <laughs> but here's my question. My question is, 
Did you ever see any indication, any documentation, any indication that this family asked that that diagnosis for Maya's discharge that they didn't like, that it be changed? Documentation, no. And under the client's rights you talked about, they had the right to do that, didn't they? I don't have the document in front of me, but I'll, if it's, if it's in your hand, I'll, I have no reason to question you, Mr. Hunter. Okay. I, I appreciate you having a chat with my wife. <laughs> um, Only if you'll do the same, sir. Okay. Deal. Um, were you aware of an, po any policy at all, Children's? regarding images and recordings of patients in child abuse cases, child abuse situations. Can you cite the policy for me? I can. It's Defense Exhibit 3019-005. Did Is you ever see that? Visible? I, off the top of my head, I can't tell you. Okay. Well, I'm not sure it's in evidence, so I'm going to pass along with it right now. But that brings me to another set of questions. In your experience as a CMO in Florida, have you ever worked with DCF? That never came across my desk. Okay. Just hand. Very well. Um, Did you uh, you told us that you had uh, you had no role in preparing any consent of the type we talked about earlier? Is that right? I never wrote the consent. We left that to the lawyers. Didn't I understand your testimony to be that the medical staff is independent of the hospital? Uh, the, in, the American Medical Association was granted autonomy around the time of the adoption of Medicare. So, yes, the medical staff is meant to be self-governing. Okay. So the mere fact that someone holds a position in the medical staff doesn't necessarily reflect any position with the hospital, per se. Is that right? I disagree with that. So you, you don't agree that the medical staff is independent of the hospital? I don't agree that uh, uh, anyone with a position of authority, regardless of who they're aligned with, can't hold a position of influence with a hospital. A board member, a com politician, a community leader. Like yourself? I'm neither. None of the above, sir. Well, you were elected president of your medical staff. I was right. and unable to serve, okay. but that was when I was in practice. That was, that was a long when you were time in practice. ago. But if you had served, yes, sir. that would not make you an employee of the hospital, now would it? That's correct. Uh, let me ask you a couple, about a couple of depositions just to be on the safe side here. You've never reviewed any of the Kowalski's depositions, have you? I have not. And you've never b reviewed the depositions of Dr. Kreisman or Dr. Kilgore? Kilgore, I have not. Dr. Posey, Dr. Sanchez? I don't believe it. I, off the top of my head, I can't comment about those. Okay. Well, let me ask you about Dr. Tepa Sanchez while I've got you on the subject here. Okay. You talked about, you, you, you referred to the text exchange between Dr. Vos and Dr. Tepa Sanchez? I believe that was brought up. Okay. Do you know who Dr. Sanchez, Dr. Tepa Sanchez is? Um, from the PICU? Yes. Yes, sir. You know what date she saw this patient? Not off the top of my head, sir. Did you, were you aware that she hadn't seen the patient for nearly three months at the time the patient, that Mrs. Kowalski committed suicide? Well, she was a PICU uh, physician, and the, Maya was in the PICU in the early days of October, and that 
unfortunate message was exchanged, yes, three months later in January of the following year. I think maybe she was referring to what she did three months before, not what the hospital did during the ensuing three months. Can you read the text for me so I can well, put it into context? I've been objecting to that, so I'll tell you what, we'll let the jury hear that from her. Okay. But the point is, you never heard from her what her explanation was for what she meant in that text message, have you? Uh, I've never spoken with her, no, sir. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Mr. Anderson, do you have any follow-ups? Did counsel here show you a single document, a deposition entry, or any other evidence that changed your opinions in any respect? No, sir. Nothing further. Anything further? Members of the jury? Do you need me to step out, Your Honor? Um, it depends. See how many questions I get. Yes, sir. I'm learning. <laughs> Questions read in one. Do you want to handicap who asked them? No, no, let's just get through this. And, and what's the name of the witness again? Dr. Um, Corcoran. 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 Okay, the first uh, question is Is Dr. Dees and Dr. Smith still at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? If not, why? Objection, uh, plaintiffs? No. Okay, so I'll ask that one. Next one has a couple of questions. If parents have ongoing concern regarding their child's daily care and treatment at the hospital and expressed it often to the staff, would the parents be advise as to the proper chain of command they should contact to voice their concern. Uh, the next question, were the Kowalskis told, I think it's they, could contact senior executives to voice their concern via email, Dr. Dr. Somebody. Next question is, and I'll put an underline so you can tell me the name of that doctor. Uh, next question, if medical staff works independently of the hospital, then who I don't know that word. I think it might be told them 
or who holds them accountable? Who holds them accountable? doctor in that second question. Anderson? No objection. And if he knows, as number two, which I think he might, and Mr. Kowalski's testimony. Okay, I'm going to overrule um, the objection to number two on red number two. So I will ask it. Okay, red number three, there's several questions. Do court orders have an effect on a patient's family rights? If a child is in custody of DCF, do the parents have the rights to consent or deny treatments during the DCF custody? Have you assisted in a case with a Munchausen by proxy diagnosis in your career? I'm assuming the first two are ones that ultimately I'm going to give legal instructions on and are not appropriate for the witness. So that leaves us the question about have you assisted a case with a Munchausen by proxy diagnosis in your career? Well, he's not being tendered as any kind of medical expert, so I don't know what matters the answers or not. It doesn't matter to me, Joey. So either objection. there's an objection or there's no objection. Objection. There's no objection. <laughs> okay, I'm going to overrule the objection and ask. And I think the last page. What is, quote, the acuity of the bed, end quote? Please elaborate what does this mean. During DeVent's review, the question was regarding the, is it acuity of the beds? Not sure what that word means in this question. I'm sorry? bemoaning the fact I didn't de de define that. So did you answer yourself if you were asking yourself the question? Pretty much. Okay, so no objection? Sure. Is that Mr. Anderson, no objection? No. Okay. Uh, before we bring the jury back, uh, I'm assuming this is our last witness today. I could probably get uh, Sounds like this is our last witness. I'm going to tell the jury, 9 o'clock tomorrow, is that what we all decided? Uh, yes, and then we'll start with the, the video depots, and then... Uh, um, the Georgia... Why don't you get the guardian and light him up and down, and then we What's up to you, Mr. Anderson? If she wants to get back, to, if she wants to get home, she's going to want to go first. Yeah, I was just trying to take off tomorrow morning to get the exhibits together. Um, yeah, we can call her first, and then yeah, we, we can talk about it. Yeah. Let's bring back the jury. Yes, sir.
Everybody. Members of the jury, just want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? And I want to confirm that uh, you have not been approached by anyone about this case since you were last with us. And you did not uh, see any uh, media accounts. Is that correct? Okay, Dr. Corcoran, uh, the jury has several questions. Uh, first question, if you know, is Dr. Dees and Dr. Sally Smith still at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? Uh, I don't know for certain. I understand that Dr. Sally Smith has... Okay. If you know or not. I, I don't know. Thank you. Okay. Um, next question. If parents have ongoing concern regarding their child's daily care and treatment at the hospital and expressed it often to the staff, would the parents be advised as to the proper chain of command they should contact to voice their concerns? That's a very reasonable expectation, and I believe that that's the way it should work. I can't say that the system in place in 2016 provided for that. Okay. Um, were the Kowalskis told they could uh, contact senior executives to voice their concerns via email or otherwise? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. If medical staff works independently of the hospital, then who holds them accountable? That's a great question. And the medical executive committee, which I was a member of for four years when I was in practice, is responsible for oversight of the physicians for quality assurance performance improvement. And the medical executive committee has a relationship with the board of the hospital so that everyone's on the same page. I hope that answers the question. Uh, the next question, and for the author of this one, I'm only able to ask one. Uh, have you assisted in a case with a Munchausen by proxy diagnosis in your career? I have not. I practiced obstetrics and gynecology, and I'm happy to say that that was not part of my experience. Next question. What is the acute, quote, the acuity of the bed, end quote? What does this mean? Uh, that would be a better question for Mr. Hunter, but I believe that he was referring to um, how sick of a patient can you care for? Some hospitals, like Venice Hospital when it was around, was a, was a lower acuity. Sarasota Memorial Hospital takes care of sicker patients, so it has a higher acuity. Okay. Mr. Anderson, that completes the juror's questions. Um, do you have any follow-up questions? No, sir. Mr. Hunter, do you have any follow-up? No. And may this witness be excused? Please. Uh, although he's still under suspicion. Okay, so you're free to go today, but you still might be called back. Okay. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> okay, members of the jury, I think this is a good point for us to stop the witnesses for today. Uh, please do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. Nine o'clock the same time. We will see you tomorrow.
do the shot clock while I'm thinking about it. Okay, the plaintiffs consumed uh, three hours and 20 minutes today. Their running total is 36 hours, 10 minutes. The defense uh, consumed 40 minutes today. Their running total is 12 hours, 50 minutes. Are there any issues we need to address before we? Well, just to be helpful, Greg, so there were a couple of objections on the Dr. Um, Neuberger's that you had some question marks, and if we could look at those so we could get rulings on those. Sure, and I, I think have part of it. For yeah. you. Okay, that's great, but I think maybe it was a missed. Miss site or? Well, I think it's just the way they designated it, Judge. So, um, Nick, do you mind? Can you mind looking with me? Sure. That's okay. Um, so, on page three, you had a question mark and of your order. I'm sorry, of your. Um, yeah. so, so, this is, is the September actually, 22nd, 2020 deposition in. Bring up uh, page 145. Yes, yes. Um, so the obje I, I have a copy of that page of the death judge. Um, I meant to put, uh, I meant to object 145, 15, the word indeed through line 21. This isn't the right one. So if I could. Uh, And the objection was breaching standard of care regarding Dr. Smith's role as investigator. Out. Okay, so, so you're suggesting that the lines 13 through 15 before indeed um, are okay by you. I, I will. Can I see it again, Judge? I don't think I objected. It was all work. I, 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 yeah, I, well. Yeah. My objection starts with the word. Yeah, I will sustain starting at the. Um, Word indeed at line 15 on page 145 through line 21. Okay. okay. And, and then the other one has to do with um, plaintiff's designation. You questioned on page four. It's um, the September 30th, 2020 deposition. I went back and checked. They did designate page 183, line 1 to 12, which is doesn't have a question. That's what they designated, Judge. Okay, so um, what I put on here is I would overrule if the correct page site. So. Well, I have the deposition Thank for you, Your Honor, if you want to look at the page. But the line one is the is hanging there. There's the page before it's not designated. Which is why I, I added right. a question mark. Oh, it looks like we we for we failed to designate. We would designate the last word of the question, but we failed to designate. Question the question beginning at page. I, I'm one. okay with the question because I, I remember last night going back and oh. looking at it. And okay. okay. Can I can I look at it real quick, Judge? Sure. So you want to start on page 182, line 23? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And then and then uh, did you want line? Can I ask counsel? Did you want line 12? You designated no, line 12. No, that just looks to be a okay. sloppy highlighting. Okay. Thanks. No, no, that was your designation. Well, I, I went and checked. Sloppy highlighting <laughs> translated okay. to a designation. Okay. All right, I understood. I think those were your only two question marks, Judge. Let me just check real quick. Maybe I should just put an S or an O. No, no, we can read sustained, <laughs> but it might help your time. <laughs> I 
do the do oh. no such comment. Okay. Uh, yes. All right. Thank you, Judge. That was the only question marks I saw. Any more designations coming anytime soon? Or I don't think so. I don't think so. So just to confirm, Council, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Neuberger by deposition, Dr. Smith by deposition, the guardian at Lightham. Anybody else? Smith. Are we doing a half day or a full day tomorrow? I didn't know the outcome of that discussion. Whatever you decide. But we just need to know on the defense side. Please don't surprise us. I, I am looking to both sides. I will do whatever you all want to do, so long as you can agree. Richards and you'd have to take to, yeah we can take tomorrow afternoon off I'll be able to get her in in the morning considering how long are those depots I, I wouldn't mind taking the afternoon off um, and, and We'll get absolutely as much in as we can in the morning. Maybe take a late lunch. Okay, so came through. Okay. So, oh goodness, You're, I'm not going to be able to have you in tomorrow until eight forty-five. So, we won't have the ability to have any lengthy discussion. But I guess if you're playing a whole bunch of depths, it doesn't really matter. So we'll start tomorrow at eight forty-five. Yes, sir. Okay, that we're starting at 845. And to be clear, Judge, my understanding is the first two Newberger depths are being read in. There's only the video for the last step. I think someone said that there was no video for depths one and two. So that's what, that's what I'm saying, Judge. Those are being read in. That's true. We'll have to read the first couple. Well, I'm sure you'll have readers. So it sounds like that's the plan, just those two depositions and the guardian ad litem and then... So did you did you want to... Because for a while you were talking about putting Maya and Jack Kowalski back on. Uh, I think Thursday. Tomorrow is Thursday. Okay. You know... I, I can't take it off. We've got to put them on because we've got the damages people the next morning, Friday that's morning. Fine. Okay, so... So tomorrow will be a full day, and then is it Jack Kowalski and Maya Kowalski coming back, or just Jack, or? It's all three, but they're- All they're, three, meaning Kyle as well? Yes, Your Honor, uh, but it's, it's simply limited to the general damages, although I would like a stipulation of some kind about the liens, so I don't have to get into that with him. I will if there's no stipulation. I'll try to work out an instruction. Your Honor, the, different, the difficulty on the, on the liens is you know, that they want an instruction that basically tells the, the jury that they will owe the liens you know, if, if a, a verdict is entered. And one of the liens, which is about $9,000, $10,000, is a, appears to me to be a straight medical. Care, Medicare or Medicaid lien, Medicaid. Medicaid. And I know that they always maintain, well, we get it no matter what. The judges normally say you get it only if there's an award of medical damages in, in, on the verdict. But what I have to do is it is it an all born hearing on that? I mean, I mean that's I mean, that's why we normally put this off to the end to let the judge decide because it's mostly it's legal resolutions based on things. The second one is in, in a is a an insurance, Aetna insurance policy claim. I've not seen the policy, and it's, it's not like it's a hospital lien or a statutory lien. It's something out of a contract. And even then, normally these things get negotiated or resolved afterwards to lesser amounts. So is, it, is it an ERISA plan? Because that even further complicates it. I don't, don't know the answer to that. Judge, we don't know whether it's an ERISA plan whether it's a lien or whether it's a right of reimbursement or a right of subrogation. And all that makes a difference. And I there's an LOP and there's two liens, as far as I know. And I believe, don't quote me on it, but I thought Jack Kowalski said he paid, either by mistake or just paid down, part of one of them. 
The only thing I'm interested in, Judge, is that I don't get a DV on damages as to that because a contingent liability like that is still a damage. And so if counsel is willing uh, to, to go with that, then we can save all that till the end. I'm willing to resolve the liens at the end of the case like we do in every other case. What I'm hearing him say is that you would not move for directed verdict on that they failed to present that the, the special, special medical the and damages and, and on the on the claim for, for fraud, fraudulent misrepresentation of the bills is what we're talking about, right? That claim, yeah. right? Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I might move for DB on a bunch of other issues, but not on that. So it sounds like we have the beginning of a, an agreement here. Yeah, I, I, I won't move for directed verdict on that count because you don't put that stuff up. I absolutely will not. All right, so I don't have to put in the liens for damages uh, for proof of the fraudulent. Uh, right, and right. For, for the Little. record, further, I don't think you need to put that evidence in for proof of any of your other claims. But maybe you, you may still need it. <laughs> Mr. Hunter seems to have a maybe not dissenting opinion. I have an issue. While they're talking, Mr. Yeah. Anderson, I would imagine the cross would be relatively short if it's truly damages and we're not rehashing mm -hmm. causation and liability. So we should be able to get through that. Schedule. No. Uh, anyway, I have I have nothing planned in terms of anything other than how did this affect? I assume that, and assuming that's true, the cross will be short. And what is there to call? So. If ultimately we decide not to call somebody tomorrow, can we just send a note to the other side? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Even okay. if it's at 10 at night. Okay. okay. So going back to our possible agreement here, you've conferred with Mr. Hunter. Yeah, I'm not going to move for a DV because they don't, they don't have proof of that, of that. And right now I don't think they have proof that they paid anything else, but I won't move for a DV on that either for purposes of that count. Okay. So are we both uh, both sides agreeing? We have a court reporter here. We're in open court. So is that an agreement? It, yes. As I understand the defense's agreement, they will not move for a directed verdict based on the element of damages since the majority of our damages has to do with the liens, which should be resolved, should not be put before the jury and should be resolved afterwards. Based on that stipulation, I will agree not to approach the issue with my client as to the th two liens and LOP, I believe it is. What's Are that? we in agreement? I concur in the agreement. Um, thank okay. you. So let's move on to the next you issue. Some concern here? No, I was just going to, I, I thought we were done. I was gonna, we're, I was we're finished with that issue. <laughs> well, I was just going to rebroach. I, I didn't get who's coming tomorrow. That's well. okay. uh, um, Let's talk about the following week. So it's the following week, it's Wednesday that, is, is it Wednesday that we're not here? Yes. yes. Okay. Are we going to be in a position, and Mr. Altenburn, to have a meaningful discussion about jury instructions maybe Wednesday afternoon? I, I, I've already kind of given the morning away for other things. I'm just wondering... Do I? I was thinking about going back to Tampa. But yes, I, well, we can do that. <laughs> well, I, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out when we're going to have time to talk about it. I, I understand. I, right, last I sent a draft to Mr. Elegant on Sunday, saying please redline these and send it back, and that, that hasn't yet. And I'm, I bet that's because he needs to talk to them, and they've been, and they've, they've been busy. By the way, I've, I've also sent him a draft of what I discussed. And a couple hours ago with him, and I know he needs to still talk with them, but I would really hope I could give that tomorrow morning. Yes. That's all. Um. But, but the rest of that, it also helps I mean if we get by the DV, then we know exactly what the package looks like. Well, I, I'm certainly hopeful that we will have rested the plaintiff's case by then, and yeah. even if we have to do DVs over lunch or go late... Or, or something. And, I, and I, I think by this weekend I'm going to know what all the evidence is so I can try to put together my thoughts on that. So I'm ready to go whenever on Monday. Yeah. So I, I just wonder if 
Wednesday afternoon is an appropriate time to start talking about the jury instructions, given that, you know, I, I know that not all of you have to be here. Maybe it's just Mr. Elliott and Mr. Altenburn to have that, this discussion. Because I don't think I'm going to need to be in the courtroom so much when we're putting on our case. So if, especially if we were doing our case on Tuesday, I could work with Mr. Elegant a whole lot before that meeting. And, and I could probably even handle you all on Zoom. Okay. If you wanted to, if, if you wanted to go that way, we to could, Tampa. Yeah. We could even be in the same room together, probably, if you wanted to. Well, you and Mr. Elliot. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so long as I actually physically had whatever you were looking at. We work well together, work with us, so. You think that's doable Wednesday afternoon? I do, but, but I'll send an email to, to Tom to see how far along he is on this as well. Can, can you let me know, like, tomorrow so that if the answer is no, it's not doable, then I'll probably give the time away to others. But gotcha. I, before I, you all get first dibs on my time, so I just... Yeah, I was hoping to have those done by the 20th of August, so I'd be happy to have them done on Wednesday. <laughs> Anything else? No, uh, Judge, I was just on William's uh, rule on the... This has to do with Sally Smith, has to do with the parent agency, and I've got two witnesses, and they're going to say that Sally Smith walked in and did the same thing to them. She did the Kowalski's. Their testimony should take about 15 minutes each. What, what is the specific issue? Because it's got to be... I don't, I don't have the list right in front of Plan me. Plan motive but. opportunity on 9404, a uh, substantially similar incident. So each one of these cases, in fact, one of them uh, ended up almost identical to this, the Kushner case. Um, and th this is situations where Sally Smith walked in, uh, either announced as a doctor or unannounced, uh, wearing a lab coat and uh, the badge, and then comes in. A, a quote, examines them, asks a bunch of questions, walks out, and they never find out until much later that this was actually a, a doctor who was interviewing them towards a prosecution. And in both cases, of course, they did end up prosecuting, but that's not part of the question. That's just simply, the only question is, did you have this happen to you so that we can show a plan, motive, or intent in terms of why they do it. And under uh, 9404 and the substantially similar incident stuff, which I grant you is usually railroad tracks or things, but it would appear to be a uh, fall within that. This, these are two people? Two people. And, and when, when do these events and where do these events occur? When do they occur? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, the Kushners happened within a year of uh, the Kowalskis and the other one about a year and a half, two years before. But I, ha I, I couldn't give you an, an exact date for the, the other one. I, didn't, I don't know it. I know the Kushner case because they're on the other side of it and there's litigation in it. Well, I don't know the details of that, Your Honor, but the, the language in, in, in 404.2 on this is that you can get in symbol or fact evidence of crimes, wrongs, or acts that are admissible when relevant to prove a material fact in, in issue, including but not limited to proof of motive. I don't see motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, or absence of mistake or accident. But it's inadmissible when the evidence is solely to prove bad character or propensity. And this smells like propensity evidence that, that we've done this before so we can do it again. Well, my, I guess my question, because I had to pull up the statute to Mr. Anderson, was because it has to be an element in the case. Right. It's got to be not and, just a side issue, but a big issue in the case. Yeah, and, Correct. And so I, I'm struggling. I mean, it doesn't fit your medical malpractice. A parent agency. It all goes to the agency argument, Judge, which is a key but, issue in the But case. Here, here, here's, and I was thinking about this the other day because, you know, I had a chance to read this yesterday. How is it that, let's say they did, this is true, that it's been doing lots of other families, but how does that impact what the Kowalskis mm -hmm. understood right. Dr. Sally Smith's role was? Because it doesn't go to what the Kowalskis understood, it's really what the Kowalskis understood. Right. Uh, 
So I, I, I don't think it goes there. I think that, that's, that's two different points. As the Kowalski's understood, it goes on the detrimental reliance and how much they told Sally Smith and what actions they took based on their belief that she worked for John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Um, so I, I don't think the fact of identification and the plan that we argue uh, was in place which the defendants acceded to was that Sally Smith would come in unannounced, and it didn't really matter, Judge, after that, what the circumstances were. It was simply that this was an ongoing pattern and plan of conduct in order to extract But if you're talking about a parent agency, it's got to be focused on the Kowalskis and their understanding and what experiences other people had is absolutely not relevant to what the Kowalskis understood, which is why it doesn't come in under medical malpractice. And I'm not sure it comes in, you know, what happens to other people under any of your other accounts. So that's why I'm, I'm struggling to see how this comes in. I think under the intentional infliction of emotional distress count, obviously Sally Smith is part of that. But I'm not going to have, I didn't plan to ask them, were you traumatized by Sally Smith misrepresenting? I, they were, but I hadn't planned to ask them about that. Okay. I guess I could ask them about whether the discovering the misrepresentation, the subsequent prosecution, was harmful to them, and that would place it as a similar incident. Unless, unless you can come up with something really strong, uh, I'm going to end up denying your, your motion because I don't think it fits under... Uh, 90.404 paren 2 paren A. Because we're uh, traveling under a parent agency is the thing, and that's... Okay. And, and it does not go what what experiences other families, and I'm not saying it didn't happen, it's just what happened to other families isn't within the knowledge base of the Kowalskis, and it's really the knowledge base of the Kowalskis that matters for purposes of your parent agency. I, I, I thought... I'll have to check there. I thought we were in on other. No. Let me check the police. Okay, so, I mean, unless something massive changes, uh, expect that motion to be denied. And just to buttress the record on that, there is a case called Trees By and Through Trees versus Kmart Corporation at 40467 Southern 2nd 401. It's a fourth district case from 1985. And it, it was reversing a civil case because something in the nature was was done and explaining this was a propensity and pattern of conduct were the same thing and that that's just a pattern of conduct which is what I think they were just trying to explain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else? Yes, no, but I just, just to quadruple check because I'm here, I'm so sorry. I was up very late last night and very early preparing for Dr. Hanna again because I'm hearing whispers and different people coming. The only people the Kowalskis, the Kowalskis are bringing tomorrow, again, are the DCF coordinator, the three Kowalskis on damages only, and the two depot designations, correct? We, uh, the we depot time, we, we have sent over the list, including Deborah Salisbury. Deborah Salisbury. And we're evaluating whether her testimony is necessary at this point or she would be a rebuttal witness. But I, we will I, let you know one way or the other <coughs> after I have a chance to speak with her after we get out here. I guess the frustration with this, and I know it's very late in the day, is unless the plaintiff wants us to be doing this to them, in our case, throwing seven, eight, nine witnesses that they know, they have no chance of us getting through. It's very frustrating to hear that we now have a lineup of seven to eight witnesses that are going to span nine to ten hours that we know we're not getting through. It's going to cause a pattern for record. Well, well. Anyway. It sounds like Dr. Er, uh, Ms. Salisbury is probably going to ultimately require some sort of proffer before. Right. And so I wonder if, from a timing perspective, is that something that is even doable tomorrow, given yes. everyone else? I think what I'm trying to evaluate is the scope of what she can say and not get into the wrong area. And I, I can't assure the court of the breath or counsel the breadth of that until I talk to her one more time. Well, it, 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 what it sounds like is she should not be a witness tomorrow, perhaps on Friday, but not tomorrow. Is what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing, but just from a timing perspective. That's fine with us. Because that means someone gets to go to bed at, at midnight as opposed to 2 a.m. <laughs> I'm in that program, and yes, okay. uh, we'll, we'll move her till Friday if we, if we do decide.
inside the user. All right, thank you. That's all your honor. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.